Okay, six o'clock. Let's call the meeting to order. Good to see so many people in the uh, gallery tonight. You always know you have a, a uh, what's the word, active community, engaged community when you get a lot of people in the gallery. It's uh, good to see. Thank you for coming out tonight. Hopefully you stay past your agenda item. <laughs> um, Okay, first thing on the agenda is the agenda. Could I get a motion to adopt if there are no additions or deletions? Um, Councillor yeah. Flowers, okay. All those in favor? It's carried, thank you. And the minutes of our last meeting. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. All those in favor? Carried again. <coughs> Delegations, Ms. Guida. Uh, good evening, Mayor Janung and members of Council. Your first delegation this evening is the Spray Lake Sawmills Recreation Park Society. Uh, they've had some changes in the last year and are here to share with Council um, all the exciting things that are happening at the, at the Rec Centre. Um, the recommended action that we're putting forward tonight speaks to uh, the ask that they will have at the end to um, help them out uh, with a $1 million line of credit uh, to help fund some of these exciting initiatives um, as they move forward without getting lost in our municipal timelines. So what we're asking Council tonight is that um, you accept the presentation and direct administration to bring a report back um, before the end of October on um, the terms and conditions of such a, a line of credit. Administration has been working closely with the board and the staff at the Rec Centre to come up with ideas on how they can continue to move the Rec Centre forward and create a community hub, so this is as a result of that. So at this time, I'd like to in, um, invite Hank Beesbrook, the President of SLS RPS, and Blair Faleski, the CEO, to come up and present to Council. Thank you. You want me to do it? Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Welcome. Your Worship, uh, Mayor Janung, members of Council, staff, guests. It's my pleasure tonight to, uh, to give you a brief presentation on behalf of the Board of Directors, the staff of Spray Lake Sawmills Family Sports Centre. And joining me in the presentation is uh, our CEO, Blair Faleski, who I will give you a brief intro later on. In the fall of 2017, the Board, along with our senior staff, spent four months developing a strategic plan with clear goals and objectives that would allow us to develop the center and the programs that we offer over the next five years. And the impetus to begin this process started well before the latest expansion, but the need for such a comprehensive document became much more apparent when the expansion opened and our mission and vision became crystal clear. I believe you're all familiar with our legal ownership structure and the many facets of recreation and well-being that our facility encompasses. We also have 10 tenants who share space and provide much needed goods and services to our membership and our guests. With sensation, it was announced that the world's largest YMCA was opening in the city of Calgary at 300,000 square feet. As you can see, our facilities beat that or exceed that by 50,000 square feet. This is our board of directors. It's made up of these individuals, uh, all of whom I believe are exceptional volunteers and have worked very hard to get us where we are today. This is a brief capsule of the growth of our history since its inception in 2001. Each expansion occurring after an evaluated risk and reward process that saw the facility maintain its goal of complete user pay operations. The last expansion, however, was the only one not initiated by the society, and as a result, I believe we were less prepared for the impact on every single facet of our operation, the single largest of which was the tripling of our staff from 65 or 70 to in excess of 200. We believed at the time that the structure we had in place could weather the change, but it did not. Our first year end following the expansion was an eye-opener to say the least. One glaring issue was the fact that we would have to come to our owners for financial support, something we vowed would never happen when our society was incepted back in 2001, but one that became a swift reality with the significant change to our business. Drastic changes were required. And this is where our strategic plan identified our shortcomings and set us on a path of change management we realized that the new policies that we had, that we needed new policies, 
new health and safety programs, human resources, and a marketing department. All key elements in a successful and growing enterprise. We made a difficult decision to change our manager and ultimately most of our management senior team members as well. One thing we didn't count on was that our new CAO, CEO after four months would fall ill and we would need to search again for a new one. This brings us back to Blair Pulaski, but also a, a shortcoming in four months of time that we needed. Blair, during his span of 26 years of continuous progressive experience within the golf industry, developed an outstanding skill set as a leader and consensus builder, which has been developed and demonstrated at various board, committee, and operational management levels. Being that conduit between board and membership, including navigational, navigating operational and financial stability, involves significant communication, team alignment, strategic operational planning, and consensus building. And these are the skills which Blair now brings us to at Spray Lakes Family Sports Center. I'm so proud to introduce him as our new CEO. Uh, thank you, Hank. Uh, good evening, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Uh, as Suzanne outlined earlier, we're here uh, with a request for consideration. But, but I do want to take a few moments and just uh, highlight some of the things that are happening at Spray Lake and uh, perhaps celebrate some of the very good things that are occurring here uh, over the last little while. As uh, I still do view uh, Spray Lake uh, Family Sports Center in its infancy. It's, uh, there's been such dramatic change in the last two years uh, and with uh, new leadership. Uh, it really is uh, still in its early stages of development and we recognize that completely. As, as part of our, our new upcoming marketing strategy, you will see a tagline, a community that plays together, stays together. This will form the basis for our forthcoming campaign that you're going to see in the next few weeks. Uh, highlighting some of the things, as you can see, we've had great success over the last summer with some of our kids' programming. Uh, summer camps, we saw a 27% increase in overall registrants of existing programs. Uh, the community is taking hold of the, of the facility. Not included in that number are 166 new registrants uh, in new programs that were introduced this past summer. In particular, we initiated a little campers division and program for ages 3 to 6, which was sold out. And, uh, and we've had very positive response from, uh, from parents and, and from the public. The, uh, the continued foundation of much of our success will be formulated on community stewardship and development of partnerships such as the Lions Club and the Rotary Clubs of Cochrane, as you can see, uh, based on, on feedback as just one example. Uh, we did open up the spray park to public access this past summer uh, in unison with help from the Rotary and Lions Club and it was it was extremely well received and based on the social media feedback that you see there as examples, it was very, very positive. The uh, continued foundation of much of our success will be formulated on and continue to be community stewardship and the development of partnerships uh, that um, um, we began new programs with the six week challenge as just one example. Uh, we, we have found that there is actually uh, a need for specialty programming at Spray Lake, in particular this one, in, re in trying to remain responsible uh, to the costs associated with the infrastructure development and the, expand the expanded personalized nature of some of the training. Uh, we are trying to obviously be very, very sensitive and committed that we do offer over 100 weekly classes and programs that are included in a membership fee. We continue to build upon our social media presence, understanding the importance of doing it in the most responsible way uh, to ensure the protection of our brand. We uh, have now centralized control and social media responses without our market, with, uh, within our marketing department. Beyond serving as a hub for small business tenants, uh, we host a variety of community initiatives that include trade shows, a farmer's market, and most recently the central conduit for Helping Hand Society of Cochrane and Western Rocky View Food Drive, which we hosted two weeks ago. Our intentions are to consider and expand social and cultural activities in the future at Spray Lake. 
Uh, these are just some of the organizations, and we have many more, and local businesses that provide leverage for Spray Lake to succeed. Our intentions are to continue to broaden those community partnerships. Our strategic priorities over the next year are really just based on four main pillars consisting of the guest experience, organizational culture, improving ease of registration for our, our guests and membership offerings, and improving and increasing our membership base and partnerships within the community. Our uh, membership offerings, uh, you'll see in, in mid-October, uh, we are streamlining those in order to elevate the sense of community. That's our intentions. We'll actually be lowering prices in some of the categories included in the, uh, included would be the family membership category to enhance value associated with Spray Lake. We believe one of our great advantages uh, at Spray is that we, we offer a, wider, a wide array of programs and, and we're really trying to get away from the silo effect of, of memberships strictly for fitness or strictly for uh, the aquatic center. And we want our members to, to, uh, to have a place to call home, to, to be able to access every one, of the, uh, every one of the events and every one of the programs and every one of the parts of the facilities of Spray Lake. By remaining competitive, uh, we believe that uh, our membership being able to do everything at the same competitive rate as some, of the, as some of the other facilities in town, including some of the fitness centers. So here's just an example of uh, the growth, the, the magnitude of the growth uh, that we've experienced over time. And I think that with the latest expansion, we just didn't realize what was going to happen to spray, what the changes were going to be. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that the owners knew either. Um, suddenly one day the doors were open and here we are, we're, we're this very, very different facility. Nevertheless, I think we're, we're up to the challenge of change that, uh, that we've identified and we believe we've got a really great team in place now uh, to direct the change, manage the change, direct the growth, identify the needs and solve most of the financial impact. When we compare ourselves to, uh, to other like facilities, uh, we believe we're doing very well. I've met with industry leaders uh, who we had uh, discussed the possibility of doing an operational audit with us to, to try and assess where we were. They all asked what we were worried about. We're better than most that they had ever seen. With strategic planning, clearly articulated goals and objectives, dedicated leadership and staff, we may never get to 100% cost recovery again, but we're just not satisfied with where we are today. We strive for excellence. Our, object our objectives are fairly clear to evolve back to this self-sustaining model. We're currently reevaluating our three to five year budget projections and in hand with our new marketing plan, we believe we'll achieve 90% in three years. So council, as outlined earlier, our, our request is, uh, is for consideration is, is quite simple. Um, we're asking council to consider providing uh, us with a dedicated $1 million capital line of credit for our facility. The intent of this facility would be really used for emergent capital of a time sensitive nature and or small, and or small programming uh, needs uh, and investments that may not be part of the annual capital budget that is approved by the town. Uh, we're, we're currently not very nimble financially. As an example, if, uh, if we do have uh, a, an emergency repair that is needed, uh, whether it's a heat exchanger in an a ice plant or perhaps the roof of the old Cochrane Arena needs immediate repair, um, we don't have uh, the, the ability to do uh, those sorts of things in a very quick, in a very quick pace, okay? Uh, just for a little more background, we have engaged Morrison Hirschfield most recently. They are going to do a, an asset life cycle study over the next 10 plus years. So we have understanding and visibility of, of what, the, uh, what the replacements are going to be. So we're, we're able to better focus on the long-term budget to provide the council down the road. But we are, are really talking about certain things, whether it's improving uh, member experience um, um, or uh, evaluating some of our programming needs, um, 
but most importantly, if something of an emergency nature takes place, we are looking for to be uh, we are looking to be a little more nimble, and hence why our request. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate the, uh, your time. All right. Well, thank you for your presentation. Very well done. Uh, very thorough. Um, before I ask uh, Councillor Reed to put the motion on the floor as our representative to the, the board, as you are well aware, uh, I just want to take the time to say thank you um, to the board for sure. Um, a group of volunteers, and I don't think a lot of people realize this in our community, that we have a group of volunteers that work hard uh, to, to deliver the experience that you're, you're talking about. Uh, I know Blair and welcome to the, I'm saying Blair because I feel like I know you now, so forgive me if I'm, oh. <laughs> um, but truly the amount of work that it has taken from and being on the board from my old terms on council, uh, and I saw the intent that you talked about, Mr. Beesbrook, about where we've gone, come from, from one sheet of ice to where we are today. I don't think anyone envisioned that back then. It's been a growth um, period, but a, a one that I think is, has been needed and one that uh, is welcomed and very much appreciated in our community. So to have a group of volunteers um, day in, day out, put the amount of effort that I've seen, that I know that you put in, and personally, uh, Hank, the time that you've dedicated to that um, facility is admirable. And I, I don't think uh, we say it enough, and I just wanted to take the time to say thank you. Um, the, the changes that you've made are um, staggering to a single organization uh, and I think you put it very well tonight that um, we added a pool, we voted in favor of a pool, we built a pool, um, but how we were going to operate that pool and the, some of the challenges that you've been faced with, um, some of them were unknown and that's okay. So the fact that you're here today I think is just a, another step in the progress of delivering that uh, recreational experience that Cochranites and area appreciate. So uh, again, thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for your kind words. Councilor Reed. Well, there isn't much left to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you, you have lots. I say. do. Um, I would like to move option one that council accept this presentation uh, for information and direct administration to I prepare a report outlining the terms and conditions of the development of a, time, uh, of a line of credit for the center uh, and be brought back on the October 28th meeting. Um, I just want to echo what uh, the mayor has said. I have had the opportunity of serving on the, on the Spray Lake board. Um, it's been an incredible and inspiring journey just to see how dedicated a, a, a group of volunteers uh, can be and, and their commitment to this is incredible. Um, you know, uh, Hank in particular, I would publicly single out as, as someone who probably, <laughs> if he weren't in the position he was, would not be able to do what he is doing. And uh, this is an incredible volunteer board. It's an example of, you know, uh, what's best in a community. And uh, that coupled with a great staff, literally trying to, to build a world-class facility, uh, it, it's just been inspiring. So thank you. Um, Having been party to this request, um, I want to indicate that I have full support of it, having seen our journey in getting to this position and recognize just how critically important it is to be able to move this agenda forward. So I'm in support of it. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Councillor Nagel. Thanks a lot for all your volunteer time uh, on the board. I'd like to echo their comments as well. Um, uh, obviously, we're not making a decision on the line of credit this evening, but I do have a couple questions. Uh, specifically, a million dollars seems like a large place to start for me. Would the organization be able to make use of, say, a smaller line of credit, like $100,000, if we started with that for a year or two? I think, uh, Councillor Nagel, I think our concern is we just, we're not sure what that number should be at this, at this stage. There's some, some larger uh, capital items that may come down the line that we just don't want to be approaching the town again for a, a, a second ask, if I could be so simple. Yeah, so, so then my, my second follow-up question is, uh, if it were a non-interest bearing line of credit, what sort of assurance would we have that the million dollar line of credit would be serviced and repaid in a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, it's a process that we, we've talked about in depth with, uh, with Suzanne and the administration team. Uh, we would reconcile that at the end of each year. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks. That's it for my questions. Thank you. 
Councilor Flowers. I too want to say thank you for all your hard work and leadership in this area. I know it's a huge business to run. I attended one meeting for Alex when he was out of town and I couldn't believe the work and the complicated issues that you were dealing with at the table. So thank you for that. And um, I just want to say I really like your slogan, a community that plays together stays together. That's awesome. Thank you. And I would definitely support this because I know the timing for paying bills and big projects coming in makes it very difficult sometimes to keep things in the row. Councilor McFadden. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, I can only echo those comments. I mean, we're fortunate thanks to our amazing volunteers that have been able to deliver a world-class facility that uh, thankfully is still a secret and we can keep it mostly <laughs> to Cochrane's use. Uh, so super proud of the facility, super proud of the uh, community members that have been delivering that for us for nearly two decades now. Uh, so I did have a couple of questions. I am really glad to see the board is stepping up and getting more strategic uh, in how you want to approach your management um, and echoing uh, Councilor Nagar's comments about the million dollars. I know we're going to get into the report and I'll probably understand it better at that, some, that point. Um, but you did kind of highlight that, um, you know, I, I just wonder if you have any forecasts of what type of capital outlay, outlays you might be expecting or as you're starting to go through an asset management strategy, what are kind of the projects you're seeing emerging? Yeah, yeah we're, we're uh, beautification of some of the, uh, the public spaces at Spray Lake. We currently have large chasms of, of areas right now that need some, some attention to feel and, and ambiance, that sort of thing. But most importantly, we don't know without the, uh, the life cycle study being completed, but I would fully anticipate uh, with what I've uh, learned over the last couple of months, the Cochrane Arena uh, roof is going to need some attention in unison with a thermal blanket. Uh, so these are the types of things that if the study comes through that there is some time sensitive infrastructure issues that are not currently built into our capital budget, that's what that line of credit would be used for. Okay, yeah, that was, and thank you for highlighting that is I think often we forget that uh, your organization also manages yes. the old arena and um, I know it's the, the home to the generals now and they take great pride in having their own barn so hopefully we can make sure that we we keep a barn for them um, I did have another question I guess oh your asset management strategy what's the timeline for that and will that be something that uh, we work together kind of as a team to make sure we're in alignment on? Yeah, I fully anticipate a proposal being done uh, probably the latter part of this week, if not early next week, um, and, and for them to be mobilized in the very near future. So we've been working on this for a good uh, month and a half or so to get to this point, uh, but I would anticipate Morrison Hirschfield to have that, that, uh, that initiated very soon, actually. Now the timeline associated with completing it, I'm not, I'm not sure quite yet but I would anticipate it's going to be probably a couple of weeks at least. So you're kind of interested in the preview state of getting a, what it's going to take to get an asset management strategy in place before the next step of actually delivering on that strategy or at least outlining what that strategy would be? I'm, I'm sorry, Councilor McFadden. So the, the work that's being done right now, Yes. is it just like an overview of the work that's going to be needed to get done or at the end of this work are you going to have kind of a list of the projects that you're going to need to manage? Yeah, but there will be a, a list of uh, 10 plus years of, of asset replacement uh, is really what they're, they're providing for us, yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, well thank you again for everything you guys are doing for the community and for everybody on the board. Um, at the end of the day, I want to do everything I can to make sure you guys remain as efficient and effective and as nimble you. as you can in making smart decisions for us. So thank, thank you very you. much. Councillor Padeco. Thank you for the information. I just have one question. Um, I know that there was sponsorship uh, at one time available. Is that something that you are still actively seeking out in the community, whether or not it's sponsorship of programs, sponsorship of rooms, sponsorship of hallways? And would that offset this $1 million? Because I'm kind of in the same boat maybe with Councillor Nagel on that one. Um, about questioning such a, such a large ask and not necessarily knowing kind of exactly where that money is all going to. So I'm yeah. curious if you're still actively... We are still that. active, yes. And is there anything on the horizon for sponsorship? Uh, we've, we've included, uh, we've had some new ones uh, occurring on a monthly basis, but the, uh, if I could be so frank, the, the, the dollars, we're talking about $10,000 $10, as an example for sponsorship, when some of the mechanical uh, failures that could exist are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially. So, so uh, as much as we're, we continue to pursue those sorts of things, and we think it's very important, uh, 
Um, I, I don't think it's going to satisfy some of the emergency uh, capital things that, that could exist. And again, I, I'm just trying to foreshadow right now without having any clarity from uh, until we get an engineering study done. Fair enough. I look forward yeah. to hearing from the report. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, everybody else has covered several of my questions here, and thank you to the board and Mr. Beesbrook and uh, all the work you've done, and uh, Mr. Faleski, um, and also Councillor Reed for being on the board and uh, reporting back to us and making everything go as successfully as it has. I was, uh, I'm heartened to hear about the 90% projection cost recovery in three years. That's um, uh, a lofty goal and impressive if you could get to it. That would be amazing. I'm, I'm curious what um, the empty restaurant space that we, we dealt with a year ago, um, might this, um, this ask today have that any impact on the status of that or what's happening with it going forward? Potentially no, uh, only because uh, Councillor Wilson, we, you know, I, I, in my assessment of that space, I'm not fully committed that we have a viable uh, plan going forward that would even get us to a break-even point. And, and our, our motivations forward-looking is that every, everything that we want to explore as far as uh, capital investment need to have some return uh, that, that justifies for us to remain responsible with the operation. That space, we, we've had many uh, people that, that do this for a living uh, looking at leasing that area, and they're telling us uh, if, if if they're telling us they're going to have a tough time succeeding doing it, I don't think that we're going to come up with the secret sauce personally to, you know, to do it ourselves. So, so we're still exploring what we're going to do with that space. I'm not so sure uh, the restaurant is uh, is what it's going to end up being. Uh, but again, we don't have any commitments as as to direction yet. We're exploring other opportunities that will work with with the uh, Cochrane Curling Club as an example for them to have some social space. And we are going to operate on a temporary basis this year. A, a lounge area area there for them for this winter, but it gives us time to assess exactly what we want to do with that space. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, also curious, Rocky View being a partner of the facility, I'm not sure that they're a partner with operational losses. I think I know the answer to that. And the <coughs> no. So uh, Rocky View would not be participating in any part of this line of credit, I assume, would be the answer. Um, as of today, no, but I'm not sure going forward. We, we initiate uh, meetings with them on October the 3rd. Ah. Uh, so we're going to uh, develop, uh, uh, hopefully, a bridge and understanding going forward. But I, I can't answer that question right now. But, but we are attempting to uh, open up dialogue. Excellent. OK. Yes. And speaking of bridges, I was just hoping you might touch on uh, we have a new bridge <laughs> opening next summer, hopefully. <laughs> nice segue. And, and a transit stop. Um, any any uh, ideas from the board about uh, Obviously, we're excited about these things, and we think that might generate some more users th coming through the doors in the year, the year to come. We'll see. It'll only help. It'll only help. It'll okay. only help. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, great questions there, Councillor Wilson. I, I, too, had a question about Rocky View, and I think I knew the answer. But So you are going to Rocky View for a similar request. Uh, generally, I think when the town and Rocky View fund um, maybe the rec center is a bad example, but other projects, uh, it's kind of a proportionate amount to the town. So if we were to go forward with a, the million dollars, then there would be something like 500, I'm just going to throw it out there, $500,000 <laughs> ask to uh, Rocky View County. That was, uh, would be uh, good to see. Yeah, Mayor Ganung, I, I think the, the initial meeting is really just an introduction, our, our administration team uh, amongst theirs. Uh, clearly, our agenda is to uh, is to uh, you know add clarity to what our perceived what we believe their responsibilities are as a 50% owner of the facility, and we hope it leads to a contribution of that nature. I don't know what that number is yet. Yeah, but, I'm. But, yeah, I was being a little course. facetious there with my lofty <laughs> goal number, but uh, I I look forward to uh, hearing the results of your you know collaboration with with the county and the, uh, obviously I'm sure our uh, administration would help you uh, with anything that you need there with, with Rocky View yes. County and as we as a council as we have intermunicipal committee meetings uh, I'm sure uh, Councilor Reed will have that on the agenda the Great. direct center so yeah. um, another uh, so the way I'm understanding and I just want to get back to the, the, the line of credit loan uh, discussion um, 
you've grown, you've reorganized your internal structure of uh, staff, and now you've come forward with a strategic plan, a marketing plan, and to be able to engage and initiate these plans, you're needing these funds to help you bridge the gap between, um, and this, I'm not t asking where it's going, but uh, mm -hmm. just in general terms, going from what you thought and what you're encountering to what you'd like to be and how to get there. Yes. This is a bit of a bridge in that until we get closer to an 86, uh, an 83 percent cost recovery. Yes, that's a very good way of capturing it. Um, the, the, some of the complexity that's uh, currently at play is our year end does not match with the town of Cochrane's year end. So the budgetary exercises, uh, we need to simplify that and we're going to work on that. We're going to move our year end in unison with the towns as well. But, uh, but I think you captured it very well. Get on. That's, uh, that's exactly what it's used for. Okay. It's intentions. Yes. Great. Uh, Councillor McFadden, you got another question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, in your presentation, I, you'd highlighted your board membership. Yes. And uh, so I see there's a Rocky View County vacancy at this point. I think I have an idea what that's about. That, that actually, as of just recently, was filled by Councillor uh, Kim McKyler. Uh, um, McKyler, yes, thank you. So we were just informed last week. So Kim will be at attending her first meeting on Wednesday morning, our first board meeting with okay. her. Great news. And then I think um, you have a general <coughs> membership representative position as well? That's correct. Okay. And then so how does that recruited for or advertised for? Through the board uh, and, and the contacts we have, uh, we actually have a candidate coming forward. He'll be sitting at the meeting on Wednesday as well as a new, he'll be sitting as an interim individual that uh, will then decide on him by himself uh, whether he wishes to join the board once he understands a little bit about the uh, the time commitment and the amount of work that he has to put forward over the next six years so six years it's, six it's years, like a that's the term it's that's like a life term. commitment <laughs> <laughs> excellent yes, thank you very much <laughs> okay no other questions comments okay the question on the floor is accept as information and direct staff to back with a report on October 28th on how to fund such million dollar loan line of credit. Okay, all those in favor? Ms. Carey. Thanks for your, uh, for your time and your continued support of uh, the great facility we have in town. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, another delegation, Mr. Deans. Good evening, Mayor Janung and Council. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce your second delegation tonight. It is the recently formed Cochrane Rainbows and Cochrane Light Up Group. Uh, they've been recently working with uh, town staff on an exciting new project that uh, they're going to present. I'm not going to ruin their thunder on this one. I just wanted to point out that we have been working with this group on this project and we feel that we're at a, a point where this is a manageable project. So at this point, I would like to bring up Stephanie Shellstead and Rob Halfyard to uh, present to you on the project. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Kanang and fellow council members. Uh, thank you for having us on the agenda tonight. I'm just going to kick things off and get things moving here because we realize we're on time. Culture differences should not separate us from each other, but rather cultural diversity brings a collective strength that can benefit all humanity. I find that quote very, very fitting for the town of Cochrane and everybody that comes here to visit and who plays in our yard. We're all about building community capacity. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is introduce myself. My name is Rob Hapgard. I am from uh, Cochrane Rainbows. Uh, my partner who is here, who we've been together for 35 years, we moved to Cochrane three years ago. Um, we're from the 50s and 60s. We had a life when we were younger that we had to leave our small towns and go into bigger cities and everything to live our lifestyle uh, and to be comfortable. Three years ago, we made the decision to come to Cochrane. Um, our hearts was all over Cochrane. Um, it just feels like home. Tonight I'm standing here with a tie on on this jacket. I can assure you three years ago, I would not have walked around so proud um, representing who I am as a person. 
So when I got to Cochrane, we went around, we looked at it, we feel at home. I've met a lot of really, really super amazing people. I've joined the uh, Interagency Council. I got on to different other groups and learned more about the people. And I just thrive every day with the vibe in this town. And I think a lot of us have a lot to inject into the community. I then met Stephanie. Uh, she was with Cochrane Light Up. She asked if we could help. We brought in almost 50 volunteers for the Cochrane Light Up from all walks of life. Again, the vibe just continued to go. Um, and um, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Stephanie and I had a good talk. Our beliefs about Cochrane, our vibe about Cochrane is very, very, very similar. So we decided that we'd join a partnership. I now sit on the board of Cochrane Light Up. Um, so there's kind of a two. There's the Cock of Rainbows that we're going to be doing a lot around town and uh, doing a lot of events. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up that's going to encompass every walk of life and every human person that walks on the soil of Cochrane. Whether you work here, live here, sleep here, play here, visit, everyone belongs in this town. So, next. So, our, what we're talking about tonight is... Um, what we want to present is a diversity crossing crosswalk downtown. When we did a lot of research around the colors, um, before you there, you'll see what the colors represent. So with the crosswalk that we want to propose tonight to get approval for is 10 colors that would represent these colors here. Um, Cochrane Light Up and Cochrane Rainbows does not want to select the colors. We want to put that out to everybody in the community as to what 10 colors that we think would truly be a representation of the town of Cochrane. Glasses. <laughs> When we talk about diversity, we know in every year of June, uh, Pride is a celebration around the world. We have a lot of towns, big cities, small cities, uh, putting in a Pride crosswalk to represent their pride and everything that comes with that. When we looked at having a crosswalk here in Cochrane, we looked at it as a diversity crossing that is a representation of each and every human that is welcome into Cochrane. So that's how we came up with the 10 colors and it's a very different than we want it to be Cochrane's own um, crosswalk. What we've done here is we took an aerial view or we found one and we put a crosswalk as to where we thought it might look good. Um, we worked with, I believe, Wally and he um, did some work and we found out that in front of the candy store across to the provincial building may be one of the best places to put it as there'll be no construction for the next several years in that particular street. Okay. This is where we're proposing. We went yesterday, the other day, we have taken a picture and we sat down and you can see, because I knew I was coming here tonight, I wasn't quite sturdy with my hand, it's a little wiggly, <laughs> <laughs> but we hope it will be straight um, with the 10 colors. Those are not the actual colors that we're proposing. Uh, that was just to give an indication where the crosswalk would look and we picked those colors because if you look at the buildings and the colors around they all blend in very nicely it's a nice warm welcoming finishing touch um, for that particular area some benefits of the Cochrane's for approving this with the town um, I think it demonstrates leadership from the top down that everyone is welcome it keeps within the vibes I've had a golden opportunity to meet with a lot of nonprofits. Everybody's philosophy and mission seems to be very, very similar. Um, I think by having it um, with 10 colors and it's a Cochrane initiative, um, it may minimize some of the vandalism that other crosswalks are experiencing at this time. Um, if it does get approved and we go through with it, we would do an unveiling in June of 2020, so it would give Cochrane Light Up and Cochrane Rainbows lots of time to do a lot of public uh, promoting of it, talking about it, and getting people familiar with it. So when it does happen, everybody has a really good concept of what's going on. 
what we hope to do, if it goes through and it's approved, is develop or make a plaque, um, which will be part of the unveiling, because once the sidewalk's in, people are going to be obviously driving on it, but the day that we do the ribbon cutting ceremony, we would do that with a presentation of a plaque, exactly what, Explaining what? the crosswalk represents for the town of Cochrane. So with that being said, on September the 29th, we have the Cochrane Culture Fest. Uh, Cochrane Rainbows and Cochrane Light Up has been invited uh, to provide some parking lot entertainment. Um, we accepted that with great honors. We have uh, Morley coming in and doing some dancing. We have uh, Argentina Haley who does a drag performance and teaching about two spirit. We have a laughter yoga group going on. We have minions. We have a whole bunch of stuff to show the spirit of Cochrane and how everybody comes together and we just are all about connecting this, bringing people together. Um, so we believe by having that crosswalk is just we have so many nonprofits and people around town that we have the same belief. And I think having the crosswalk kind of brings us all together so we can continue to promote and celebrate what Cochrane is truly all about. I also think it will bring a lot of um, awareness and acceptance to every walk of life so people can feel safe in Cochrane, um, proud to live here, proud to call it our home. We can look after our youth, we can look after our seniors, we can look after any vulnerable people if we're all continuously celebrate together. So I think that's what we really want to focus on is the crosswalk and how that is just the icing on the cake, if you will, that we're all under this vibe together and we'll create a very safe, welcoming community for all. Uh, the price that came in was between twelve and 14000 um, <clears throat> I contacted Air Drew Pride, I contacted Phil Price. That is, seems to be the price for these types of price walks. Um, on the one that we're looking at is a five year warranty. Um, any vandalism that may occur, Cochrane Light Up and Cochrane Rainbows is willing to fundraise and absorb the cost of repairing it. So we're just asking for the money to put the actual sidewalk down, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. Okay. I was waiting for one more comment. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming forward tonight. Um, see, Councillor Fideko is going to put the motion on the floor. Uh, I just, again, I, I thank the last delegation for the work that they're doing in our community. I want to do the same for the both of you. Uh, Rob, you've been here, as you said, three years to be in front of council and asking and pushing, and I see you in the community. Um, welcome addition to the community. Thank you for your efforts, and uh, Stephanie, I, I was going to say Steph, sorry. Uh, <laughs> for the Cochrane Light Up, obviously, and all of the volunteering work that you do and the initiatives that you're pushing behind, um, it's truly what makes us a special community, and I think what you're after tonight will only uh, help that, so. Thank you. Councillor Verdick. Um, I'm absolutely proud that this has come forward. Uh, kudos to you guys for taking on such a big project, and I know it's not going to be easy, maybe determining what those final colors are. Um, I am curious, this is probably more a question for Mr. Deans, as to, uh, as to the cost and as to what guarantee these guys are going to have that, they're, uh, that this is going to have a, a long lifespan. Sure, through the chair to Councillor Fedenko, that's a good question. Uh, we looked at a few different options that included just street paint, like a lot of the other crosswalks that you see in other communities, as well as the thermal inlaid plastic. So similar to what we see in some of the crosswalks where they actually inlay it into the asphalt surface itself. And in talking to the uh, supplier and installer of this product, they, they do feel that there is a, a better opportunity to, to wash any kind of vandalism that might occur off the thermal plastic versus the paint, which ultimately would probably wear out like our line paint does and need to be repainted each year. We feel that we've got between the six to eight year lifespan with this type of product. We feel it's the best product for th this application. And is this product something that has been done in other communities or is it something kind of cutting edge that maybe, uh, that maybe we're getting into? Well, the supplier that does most of our thermoplastic that we got the quote from for this uh, has never done one of these like this. So it was a little bit of a cutting edge type of uh, application. Normally they just work with a typical white pattern 
crosswalks. So definitely new and innovative. Awesome, good to hear. Um, you have my full support to get this done, and I know that maybe some people in the community will argue that, uh, wow, that's that's obviously a big price tag, um, but the way that I look at it, and I know that I've mentioned this behind the scenes, we have a lot of cultures here in Cochrane that are all tax-paying citizens, and you know what, I think this, uh, this does kudos to all of them, so thank you for bringing it forward. Um, the company that's willing to uh, install it has given a five-year warranty. Uh, for all normal wear and tear, so the only thing we would worry about is the vandalism part of it. And the quote that they had just given us, uh, rather than 90 days, they said they would hold that same quote for one year. Awesome. Councillor Reed? Uh, thank you for the initiative. Uh, I really appreciate the theme and the approach in terms of that kind of multicultural, multi focus kind of uh, uh, theme. I was just curious, uh, have you? I know you've probably been hard at work at, at many other things, but I was wondering if you had any opportunities to check out if there were any grants available to help offset these costs. I recognize that there may be some federal funds available from a multicultural perspective, but I'm not certain if you've had a chance to, to explore that. No. No? no. Okay. Sorry. Councilor Flowers. Yes, thank you for all your work on this. I love the community spirit and the togetherness that you talk about. Um, I too was going to ask about the grants because um, there, I think there probably is some somewhere. Um, hopefully you have time in the next few months to be searching that out and maybe a fundraising initiative here in Cochrane, but I fully support moving forward with it. Okay, Councillor Wilson. Thank you for the presentation and the work of the volunteers. Um, I had a question just in clarification of what uh, option one is recommending. And that is that we include this project in the 2020 budget for council consideration, which means we are not approving $15,000 right now. It'll only That's be right. brought into the budget for deliberation. Is That's right. Right, thank you. And so if I could, I was also hoping that, uh, is there, would there be anyone in administration that could update me on where we are with our current community grants and civic partnership review and recommendations we're doing? And if this would, uh, if that would have any bearing on this decision? by the time we get to it, at least in November and budget process. I can be more specific if you like yeah. if that helps. Well, we're currently yeah. updating that policy to bring forward to council prior to budget or as okay, prior you. to the budget, but I don't know that this would fall into that as this is a crosswalk in us. We're not giving them the money. We're creating a, like a, we're, we're building it and maintaining it. Uh, Does that make sense? So okay. we'd have to talk about that. Like this is our crosswalk budgets we have in their roads department. So. Okay, thank you, and, and so that answers my next question, I think, which is, is there any private volunteer fundraising going on for this? And the answer would be no, because this would be part of our town budget for crosswalks. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions, thanks. Okay, oh, Councillor Padeco. Can I ask one more? Uh, Mr. Deans, would this, um, obviously would this be above and beyond um, the crosswalk budget so that, you know, we're not taking away from maybe uh, some people in the community that might have safety concerns about crosswalks that are already on the block? That is correct. Perfect, thank you. Okay, no other questions? No? Okay, so uh, as Councillor Wilson has pointed out, this motion is to accept, obviously, the presentation, but also to direct administration to include that 15,000 in the budget so that we can debate that item just like we will any other item in the budget. So not an approval tonight, it's an approval to put in the budget. Uh, okay. All those in favor of doing that? That is carried. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Weldon, public hearings. Yes. Good evening, Mayor Janung, members of council. Uh, tonight I am asking uh, council to establish public hearings for bylaws 23 2019, 24 2019, and also a non statutory public hearing for the Fireside Stage 2 Neighborhood Plan. These items were brought to you at the September 9th council meeting. However, the required advertisements were not published in the newspaper in accordance with the Municipal Government Act. As a result, the public hearings need to be set for the next council meeting taking place on October 15th, and I am asking council to set the public hearing dates for the proposed bylaws and the neighborhood plan amendment to October 15th, 
2019 at 6 p.m. Okay. Um, the only question I will ask is that the issue that arose has been rectified and you're not going to be rescheduling? No. Okay. You are correct. Yes. Awesome. Somebody want to put a motion? Councillor Flowers. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question, actually. Okay. I will be missing that meeting, so if I miss all three public hearings, does that mean I can't vote on anything to do with them? That is correct. Would you like to suggest a different date? It would need to be the following one if, in that case, but is that too long? It's a good question to administration. Does m moving the date to the following council meeting past, would it be November, I guess? Right. Would that um, affect your, anyone in the process? Sorry. Now we're already one meeting. Right, yeah, we are, we are already delayed uh, by one full council cycle. Uh, delaying again, we'll have another full council cycle delay. Uh, I do know that the, uh, the applicants in particular for the fireside related amendments for the bylaws and the neighborhood plan amendments um, are, are wanting this to proceed as, as quickly as possible. Councillor Flowers, do you need to be I'll in just attendance? excuse myself then from... Yeah. Okay. Do you want to put the motion on the floor then sure. while your light's on? <laughs> um, the council schedule... Is it three different motions? Yeah. No, all together. All together. The three public hearings that we postponed to October 15th at 6 p.m. 2019. Okay. Any other discussion? No? All those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your leniency. All right. This could be a longer item. You guys want to take a break before we get into it or keep going? Okay. I'm good to go. Mr. Devanna. All right. I'm here to talk about the uh, uh, Cochrane Innovation Center and Transit Hub. And we've got a series of uh, presentations here. Uh, the first one, uh, we've got Greg Barcy in the audience. He's been key in, in us uh, uh, doing some of the uh, preliminary design work uh, for the uh, for the uh, new building. And I've got uh, Gary um, Mundy, uh, to, uh, who is our architect on the job, and he is first going to provide us with a presentation on how we got to where we are now as far as siting of the building. So I would ask Gary to come up, and uh, he's going to start out, and then I'm going to follow him after that. Come on up, Gary. Moving forward with the mouse? Um, uh, okay, you can go this way or that way. All right, so, uh, Mayor Ganug and uh, councillors, thanks for seeing us uh, this evening. Uh, this won't be a really long presentation, and uh, Dave can get back to uh, telling you about his plan. So, um, we, um, this is really going to be an update as to uh, where the consulting team has, has come to uh, in terms of massing the uh, innovation and transit hub, uh, the building on the site. So <clears throat> as you are all aware, the transit hub is um, on Railway Street and is kind of centered on the axis of 2nd Avenue. And it is one of the three sites from the tri-site con um, concept, uh, which includes the future cultural hub uh, to the south. And um, what we wanted to do was uh, very first uh, is look at um, how a building would work best on the site um, once we introduce uh, the idea of connectivity. So uh, at, at the core of this site um, is the idea that there's a new pedestrian connection uh, in the alignment of 2nd Avenue um, from the north side historic downtown to the south side um, of the new downtown. 
And uh, we think of these as key ordering elements, the, the alignment of Second Ave, uh, which uh, terminates on the site, the future cultural hub, or um, depending on what happens, the, uh, the, the other side of the valley beyond. And um, the other uh, key ordering element we see is Grand Boulevard from the south, in that the, uh, the view could very well terminate on whatever happens um, on the transit hub site. Um, one of the things that we don't know yet is where that track crossing is going to occur. It could occur on the west of the site, which is number two, or on the center of the site, which is number one. Um, and one of the things that we can't really do is, is wait until we find out whether uh, the province is going to be in support of the crossing at uh, Area 1 or Area 2. So we thought maybe the best thing to do would be to come up with a site design that uh, would accommodate either eventuality. So uh, the, the site would work just as well if the crossing was at the west or at the center. So uh, what we did when we overlaid the, uh, the kind of key ordering elements and those uh, potential crossings is we get a rough map of, of really where we want building not to be. And um, what that does for us is it, it kind of identifies a, a parcel on the east side of the site um, that is really a good size and shape for um, the new uh, transit hub and innovation center. Um, we, we further overlay um, the sort of primary and secondary uh, pedestrian desire lines through the site, so where people are going to want to be and want to walk once they uh, get there. And uh, really, with preserving the idea of having a crossing at either location, that western side of the site is uh, going to be used uh, or going to want to be used for a lot of transiting through the site by pedestrians, so it further reinforces this idea that um, a, a building today would, would work a little bit better on the, on the east side, um, allowing those pedestrian movements to occur regardless of where that crossing goes. Uh, taking that a little bit further and looking at a basic concept of what that building may be, um, this is a roughly a 15,000 square foot footprint. The building um, that we're talking about today would be a three-story building, total of about 45,000 square feet. And um, what we've done is we've created the, uh, the sort of northeast side of the building to uh, align with the edge, um, the eastern edge of Second Ave as it comes up. So the idea is, is that um, with this site development and potentially uh, future site development on the west side, that that uh, built form of Second Avenue would continue on on the, uh, on the south side of the tracks so it would provide a visual cue that links you from the north side to the south side and it would really sort of the intention is to draw you through as a pedestrian and, and, and you know let you see that second ave or feel that second ave continues on the other side of the tracks. The other thing that this shape does really well um, is that it terminates the view or the view shed of, of Grand Boulevard onto that long face of the building that faces almost uh, due west and uh, the, the general shape that it creates with depending on what gets developed on the, on the west side of the site in the future, it, it creates a shape that really uh, does a good job sort of embracing the new downtown. So it's really about connecting to old downtown and embracing um, the new, uh, sort of the south side of downtown. Um, and, and it also provides you a, a fairly sizable plaza for uh, potential uh, civic uh, um, functions like farmers markets or um, you know just about anything it's a, it's a very large site <clears throat> um, this is the site a, a little bit more hardlined again um, we're not sure where the crossing is going to be it could be um, in the center and it could be on the west uh, the transit layby where the um, the buses would be stopping to um, pick up passengers is uh, running along the sort of uh, southwest edge of the site. And uh, you can see how the parking would develop on the, on the south future cultural uh, hub site. And uh, there is uh, sufficient parking uh, in this plan to meet all the bylaw requirements. 
In terms of three dimensions, what this looks like is, um, you know, today the site is, is blank. And um, the first thing we overlay is, is um, those, those primary ordering elements, the view corridor from 2nd Ave and the view corridor from Grand Boulevard. Uh, we put those primary secondary desire lines uh, for pedestrians on and um, we get our resultant um, massing for uh, the built form today, um, leaving that um, western parcel of land uh, for future developments and uh, a rough idea of what that development might look like if it was uh, a maker space, let's say, and um, a future uh, heavy rail uh, station service of some sort. And that's the last slide for this. So I'll turn it back to Thank you. Gary. No, thank you. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions for Gary uh, at this time? No? All right. So maybe you stay close by. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be uh, one or two at the end. <laughs> All right. Let's see if this thing works here. You guys look this way? Okay. All right, so what, um, so right now, so we have an opportunity to build a transit hub. We have uh, funding for that. We have funding for Gary to do the design. Um, <clears throat> but what we wanna talk to you about now is there's an opportunity to leverage the transit funding to build this larger building, this 45,000 square foot building. And I wanna go through the administration's thinking about why we could do this, how we can do this, and that this is a viable project to allow us to venture into creating a um, kind of a tech sector in our downtown. And I'm, I am gonna introduce you later. We have uh, quite a few uh, guests here that have come from the tech sector um, in support of us creating an incubator type space in the future. So the idea here is to use the former Esther Bulk Station. We've put out a name here. This is not to be cast in stone in any way, but uh, the Cochrane Innovation Outpost, you know, playing off our Western culture and, and, uh, and our innovation uh, sector at the same time. Um, a three-story building uh, with the main floor, uh, with the footprint being 15,000 square feet and a 45,000 square foot footprint overall. Why would we want to create an incubator space to expand our tech sector in town? What, what, what is the interest of the town of Cochrane in doing this? And so what we've uh, come up with is the project benefits. It will foster jobs in the innovation sector these are high paying, uh, good um, family oriented jobs in town, reduce the commuting that is going on now. Um, it creates development interest in the area. We believe that whatever building we build uh, on the uh, transit hub site is going to lead to other further developments in the area. And we did uh, recently go to uh, Ontario to have a look at an uh, incubator there, a very successful one, and found multi, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment that went around the building because people wanted to be in close proximity to this, uh, to the tech sector. Of course, if we if this does happen along railway, and we and railway becomes a very important street in, in town, uh, then it's going to contribute additional property tax dollars. Uh, to the city or to the town. It will establish us, especially in the group of municipalities between 10 and 50,000 uh, as, as a leader in the innovation sector. We're already a leader in that we have over 400, we think 50 innovation sector type employees. But if we set up an incubator, uh, we will certainly become a leader in, in this group and, and an example of how one goes about diversifying their economy. And then finally, and we have a few of our new residents even here today, um, we will be attracting people 
that will be coming here to be in the innovation sector and, uh, and become citizens of, of the town of Cochrane. Uh, you've seen this. I just want, you know, this is where we, we think we're going as far as the building and where it would go and how it relates back to the CP crossing and how it relates to the parking uh, and how this is uh, consistent with the tri-site project and what, what was approved earlier this year. I've got a pointer, so I'm gonna, it's a little bit harder to see. I'm gonna work from here. So building footprint, 15,000. What we're talking about is a public space on the main floor of 8,000 square feet, which is primarily for the transit hub and some additional municipal services downtown. So, so citizens would not necessarily have to come up here to the ranch house. They could uh, do their municipal services downtown moving forward. Uh, rental space on the main floor, we're envisioning possibly up to 2,000 square feet for a coffee shop uh, for the transit and the incubators and the innovation companies in the building, plus 5,000 square feet. And we were looking at some type of professional services going in there, types of businesses that can help the incubators move forward, accountants, lawyers, insurance people, bankers, those types of people. Incubator space on the second floor. So this is where we're looking for early startups type people uh, to occupy this space at nominal cost. Then we are looking to have commercial rental space on the upper floor. This is key to the financial plan and making this a viable project moving forward because they're helping subsidize this nominal space in here in the middle in the incubator space. We are estimating at this time that the building will be $9 million, of which 4.6 will be funded by the Green Trip funding. And what we're trying to do is build two additional floors and leverage that money with $4.4 million. And there, I have a few more slides telling you how this might be possible. Uh, we would have to borrow this 4.4. If we borrow money at 3% over 30 years, it'll cost us 50,000 per million, 4.4 you know, million. Um, all these costs will be covered by the commercial tenant. So this is not going to cost the property taxpayer more money. It's the tenants in the building will subsidize this debt and pay for their portion of the building. We figure the construction costs um, right now are 300 for the main floor, which includes all the servicing, main floor building, foundation, all those key elements that would have been funded anyways on the transit hub. And we feel because of the type of space that the innovators are looking for, which is primarily an open space, that we can do the upper two floors for 150. Rent would be for the commercial spaces on the first floor and on the third floor would be at $20 plus the triple net cost, like for insurance, you know, maintenance, cleaning, all those types of things, uh, property taxes. And then the 15,000 square feet would pay non-market rent, like zero to you know, a small amount to encourage them to become more efficient companies. So we've got the capital cost 9 million, green trip funding 4.6, borrowing 4.4, total capital funding 9 million, net capital zero. I have left in room here for donations and grants. We are meeting with the minister this week we do feel that we have a very good project that's consistent with the provincial messaging around diversifying the economy, creating jobs. Um, so we think that there may be an opportunity to, uh, to get a grant uh, from, um, you know, perhaps from Alberta Innovates or from the, uh, uh, from the Economic Development Department. And we haven't even explored the idea that we could possibly get corporate or uh, you know, type donations that might, might want to be associated with this building and may want to give us uh, um, some kind of um, contribution towards the project. Notwithstanding what we're saying, without grants, without donations, that the project is viable from a capital perspective. 
So I'm going to go through this one. So this is the same set of assumptions up top, no change. But I wanted to go through the revenues and the expenses and the net operating surplus of the project. So basically we're saying that the top floor, the third floor would be rented at market rent. That's going to generate 300,000. The coffee shop, 2,000 will generate 40,000. The office space on the main floor will generate 100,000. The municipal services on the main floor, 8,000 square feet, we have a policy that says that we contribute towards that. That's 112,000. And then we have the triple net cost. So I've calculated everything excluding taxes at around $6 a square foot for insurance and, and janitorial and all these types of things. <clears throat> Security. Um, all this stuff listed here actually. Six dollars, I calculate it's about two dollars a square foot for property taxes. Now it's a municipally owned building, but because there are commercial tenants, the commercial elements are taxable under our assessment laws. The non the public spaces, our space, is non-taxable. So what will our expenses be? Our our known fixed expenses. So wages and benefits, so we developed this model based on having an executive director. So we're saying that we, we have to have somebody that will run the facility, will be out there, you know, hitting the pavement, you know, getting, making partnerships and contacts with whether they're for the universities, with government agencies, um, with the private sector. It's crucial. So we feel we need to have an executive director. All the costs for the executive director will be cost cover, recovered through the revenue uh, model. Debt servicing for the 4.4 million, that's 222,000. Again, covered by the revenues above. And then there's facility maintenance, unscheduled mason, cleaning, water, power, gas, insurance, contract services, licensing. Adds up to 604. So we're saying there's 74,000. So I have not tried to predict what kind of marketing plan we're going to do, what kind of business plan we're going to do, all those things. I feel like we have to um, create an advisory board, get the executive director, let them decide you know, what the actual business modeling will be. But based on these numbers, I feel we can build the building subject to getting a detailed costing, and I feel we can operate the building without imposing a burden on a, on a taxpayer. So there's a couple of little notes in the bottom down here, note one. Economic development staff will assist the <coughs> executive director in managing and operating the facility. So what I'm saying here is that there are three people in economic development. We see all three people uh, relocating to this location. We see <coughs> their uh, both the manager, the economic development officer, and the clerical staff person working, helping the executive director, uh, director run the facility uh, so that they have some support. Um, life cycling for assets to cover this new $9 million building. We're saying that that will be covered through our regular means, which is our 1% infrastructure gap reserve, which we've been building year after year, and that, mo that money will be covered here. And then uh, uh, this is a, a peripheral benefit, but we are getting to capacity up here in this building. And what if we are to construct an 8,000 square foot public facility down there, that will free up space here. And we are still a growing community. So we will be have additional space opened up here, plus we'll have space downtown, which will allow us to, um, um, to grow without having to expand this building. And I think that's a major uh, benefit of this project. There are some additional projects that are going to take place um, while we're doing this building. And one of those is the CP pedestrian crossing, which is an approved project in your current budget uh, for $2 million. Um, we estimate that the crossing just the physical crossing you know, of the railway track on the railway property will be 1.3 million, which is consistent with 
another crossing we are doing. And, uh, and we feel we can use the remainder of that $2 million approval to do the plaza, the walkways, and some of the connections between the south side and the north side. This is already approved funding, uh, but we'll, we expect to, uh, can, to do these projects at the same time. Then off-site parking. So what we're not recommending, any parking on the site. We are recommending to put all of the parking on the uh, vacant one-acre lot across. Uh, we are uh, consulting with our inclusion committee to make sure that they're satisfied with that as it relates to the uh, uh, handicap parking. And we estimate that it will be 500000 It could be a little more. Uh, but we do have $3 million allocated in the Community Revitalization Fund. So again, there is no additional cost on the taxpayer to do the building, the CP crossing, and the off-site parking lot. So next steps, if you guys approve tonight, our council, if you approve tonight, um, us moving ahead with the detailed design and costing for a 45,000 square foot building, money's already been approved in the budget as for the transit hub to be able to conduct this work. But I need you to tell me it's okay to do that on a three-story building instead of a one-story building. Um, <clears throat> So right now we're on the third line, seek council approval to proceed with the detailed design and costing. I'm doing this. <coughs> we'll confirm our commercial tenants for the first and third floor. I have had some detail, you know, conversations with uh, tenants, external tenants that are prepared to go into the building. So this one would be confirmed in the next uh, two months. Contact post secretary uh, institutions discussion partnership so there's this one is a we want to do a preliminary um, contact we would really like the executive director to ultimately be involved in who the contacts are who the partners are we would also like the advisory committee to be involved involved uh, but at this point we're wanting just to seek out some interest to see if there's interest Um, then we'll finalize the design and costing if you approve tonight and we'll bring it back to you for December and then you will make a final decision whether you want to proceed with the construction of this building at that date. So right about the same time you approve the 2020 to 2022 budget. So this is not your final decision tonight, kind of my point. Um, we're going to be advocating for funding. We are doing this next week and we will continue doing this uh, to see if we can reduce the debt burden or be able to afford a more costly building in the event that the design becomes higher. Approve a borrowing bylaw in December, same time you do the budget if you approve the project so that we can borrow the 4.4. Form the Cochrane Innovation Center Advisory Board January to February 2020. So this is only three months away. Some people thought, you should do this right now. I'm like, it's only around the corner. Like it's, you know, it's, it's actually uh, very close. Um, and we usually go through a process to get a, a board like this, you know, with public advertising and all that kind of things. But you will have to need a specific set of skills to help the board advance, similar to what we have, you know, in the way of a board with the, with the rec center. Then commence the construction of the building in the spring of 2020. We are working now as if this is happening because we have to build either a transit hub or we have to build the whole thing, like the innovation outpost. We are assuming we're gonna be in the ground either way in the spring. It's just a matter, is it a 15,000 square foot building or is it a 45,000 square foot building? Um, our plan is to have the building constructed at least to the point where tenants could start to go in there and do tenant improvements by December 2020. Hire the executive director, January 2021. Now some people have said, Dave, why aren't you hiring this person right now? We need them on the ground. I go back and say, I don't have any money. 
right? We haven't, nobody's renting a building that doesn't exist. So we need to have money before we can hire people unless we want to fund it out of reserve or something. So based on no money, January is the earliest point we could hire this person, assuming the building is constructed. Then we have developed an application process for people to get in the incubation center. The expectation is that the Cochrane Innovation Center and Advisory Board will develop this application and will be the arbitrary arbitrator in, with the executive director of who ends up in the building and then develop an application and approval process for the first floor on who is allowed on the first floor that will be there to assist the incubator people. So the recommendation is that council direct administration to proceed with the detailed design and costing for the Cochrane Innovation Center and Transit Hub and bring the findings back to council by December 9th, 2019. But before you deliberate and ask some questions, I, I, we do have some guests. Um, we have Nathan, Nathan Clausen from 4i Innovations, Sh Shane um, Peg from 4i Innovations. We got Tom Grolin, the CEO from, uh, from the uh, MC Things. Uh, we actually have some of our Smart Cities people here. Um, Kevin Shire, who is uh, on staff, and then we have Mark Eaton from the co-working. I've told them I would give them up to five minutes to express why they think it would be important to have an innovation center in town, so I'm hoping you will We'll accommodate that. I see we have letters in our package. I'd like to hear the background of that, sure. Come on up, Nathan. Council? And Tom and yeah. So this is Nathan, and this is Tom Grolin, and this is Shane. This is Shane. All right, five minutes. We can do that. <laughs> All right, so thank you for confirming the, those letters have gone out uh, digitally received or printed, uh, received by mayor and council. Thank you for receiving those and for consideration of this, uh, this presentation and the recommendation in front of you. Um, because you've already received the letters, I want to draw your attention quickly to the letter um, penned by Jim Rooney, Garmin Canada CEO, Kip Fife, our CEO at Four Eyes Innovations, and Tom, uh, CEO of MC Things. Um, that's an important letter, I believe, um, as a resident of this, uh, this town, seeing that three uh, senior leaders, business leaders in our community have put their signatures on one letter in this space. Uh, shows a lot of solidarity and talking to each, all three of them as we got, as I got those signatures. Um, I see that in the conversations that I've had. Uh, I want to give uh, Tom a few minutes, sorry, two minutes, to, uh, <laughs> to share a little bit of his own story and I think it, it really emphasizes the value of this innovation center type concept here. Yeah, thank you so much and uh, thank you for having us. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, I was, we moved from the Netherlands to uh, Cochrane uh, back in 2000, uh, grew up here, went to high school here, uh, and uh, a few years ago, well, I would say 10, 15 years ago, uh, I built a large shop with my uh, dad uh, to, and at that point I wasn't very in favor of it, but um, <laughs> Looking back now, that is one of the pivotal points for MC Things. So MC Things, uh, we build uh, Internet of Things solutions for large corporate uh, customers, uh, including, for example, PCL uh, construction. We work heavily with Microsoft. And one of the biggest challenges for a startup like ourselves really to start is, you know, you're, you're talking to these multi-billion dollar companies, you want to set up meetings, and where do you do that? You know, you, you have a shop and, uh, you know, you, you're fortunate, we're fortunate enough to have had that uh, a shop where we can bring people in and actually hire people and have the space to operate. But it's usually that space in the first year or two that is so difficult to get, so critical to a business to really be taken seriously and to be able to focus on, on building a business that can ultimately grow, grab a lot of, uh, uh, grab attention and, and, grab in, and get investment. Um, so, for us, uh, I was lucky enough that uh, back, uh, back then we built a shop and we were able to utilize that space, but most startup companies don't have that. And that's really where the seed starts, to have a space, to start to have meetings, and to start to build uh, something exciting. So, uh, this project would uh, be able to, for new startups coming in, would be able to really give them a leg off uh, up over competition and really be able to drive success. 
All right, I think another important story um, is Shane's story. A recent uh, arrivee, I would say, in Cochrane with his family, uh, but really speaks to, to the strength that our current tech sector is already bringing into Cochrane pre-innovation center. Uh, we are already attracting um, key leaders in the tech space, um, those who went and traveled uh, to the Kitchener-Waterloo tech ecosystem. There are a number of, of uh, tech players in that space, likely the, I guess the, the Silicon Valley of Canada out east for sure. Um, but Shane, maybe come and get, again, give us two minutes of your story. More or less. More or less. Hi. Thanks, Council. Uh, yeah, my name is Shane Pegg. Uh, we just moved here five weeks ago from Waterloo. Uh, my wife, who is a high school teacher, so she walked from that job, high school business, three young children. Um, we were involved in the community, community foundation group, uh, worked with the council there on getting some funding uh, for some of my previous roles. So I spent uh, a few years at Rim Blackberry um, in the early years on the up and then was watching it as it was going down. Moved over, I was part of a high-tech incubator associated with the University of Waterloo called the Accelerator Center. I was on the leadership team there for a few years. Um, helped launch uh, an accelerator center in a town of Stratford, 30,000 people, very similar size uh, as what we have here in Cochrane. Um, then I jumped into, after that, so I was around a lot of startups where we were giving them programming, space, um, funding, working with the federal and provincial government to get funding into them. And then I jumped into a startup and there was five of us working out of uh, our founder's basement. And so I was on part of the ownership team. There's four of us that own the company. We were growing, it was a sports tech startup. And um, we were looking to grow after three years, selling into 40 different countries around the world. And we were located after the first year in a basement, we got a small shop. We were looking for funding to grow it. We talked to the CEO of Four Eyes Kip. We'd heard about him. And that conversation went from uh, an investment to, hey, why don't we buy you guys? Would you be interested in moving out to Cochrane? Six of us in the company, all six of us packed up from Waterloo, hundreds of startup companies. All of us had jobs well into the six figures um, that we could get, but we all packed up, moved. I was the only one with kids, but the other ones had spouses, girlfriends. We all moved out to Cochrane. We've all settled right in Cochrane. So when you talk about success stories, you know, there's one where you've got six of us coming from Waterloo, coming out here to Cochrane. So we've settled here, have started getting involved in the community. One of the things I was fortunate enough to have uh, or participated in was with the mayor and others coming out to Waterloo and Toronto, checking out the ecosystems and, and helping facilitate some of that conversation. It was exciting for me being part of that tech ecosystem, but the br broader kind of innovation ecosystem, which extends beyond tech communities, but just the collaboration with the arts and other communities, seeing what there was, uh, the path that they were going down here, and with the mayor and others, kind of their vision, that was kind of part of the exciting play that my wife and I, we decided to make the decision to join the move west to come out here to Cochrane. We've settled here, and so we've seen the value, I've seen it firsthand, being with the startup, enjoying the benefits of the incubator and being part of the leadership of an incubator, both sides, how the startups, when we first start, there just needs to be a leg up, somebody to take care of some of these little things so that these people with the, the big visions, the dreams, can get just that little extra boost to go forward. Not everyone's gonna be successful. We had many in our incubator that would come in for a bit, but they would leave and we would have programs to move them along quickly, but they could get involved but being part of a community that Blackberry went from 20,000 at its peak, 12,000 of them being located in Waterloo with 50 buildings plus there. When that collapsed, all of a sudden there was a, a extra buildings, extra space, a lot of executives, and there was a lot of talent, a lot of funding, and all that was able to come together to say, how can we help these startups? And so I've been able to kind of witness and be part of and support many startups that grow. And I would, I would leave you with um, the fact that what I've seen there just the passion and the value of the volunteers, the people I've met in the short five weeks I've been in town. Um, I do see a lot of value and it excites me and the family and those I've met with the potential of this innovation center. So thanks for the opportunity. All right, and just one quick closing comment from myself. Uh, the other letter you received was my letter. Um, <laughs> I came here, I uh, moved back to the province four years ago. My wife and I chose Cochrane. I've never regretted it for a, a millisecond, um, but I was commuting two hours a day around Calgary. Um, we wanted to live here, um, but there was no professional opportunity for me here. Um, and when I got involved in the Smart Cities a submission that we did a couple years ago, just to be a volunteer in my community, bring my professional skills in some way, uh, that's how I also got introduced to Kip Fife and Victoria Brills from Four Eyes Innovations, um, which led to 
um, joining their leadership team five months ago. Um, and I have now actually been able to eliminate two hours a day for, uh, I think I'm sure I, I walk, I'm the closest person to our building, which uh, I'm super grateful for. So that, that's been a massive impact to our family's quality of life and my ability to bring my time uh, even more to the table in Cochrane. So uh, you'll likely see more of me and others. Uh, we have a lot of capacity in town already that's willing to bring what they know. Um, we're, we're very thankful, I'll say, for what I saw in the, in the numbers. You know, Dave's our numbers guy. There was an allocation in there for an executive director. Um, that's not a lot of money relatively but what that type of strategy does is it creates a footing and there is a lot of capacity to take that seed and actually within our business sector our business community and others to actually blow that up and really take that somewhere but this uh, this type of consideration of a footprint and a little bit of uh, seed funding is really the catalyst i think for where this could go thank you for your time thank you dave can we can i ask a question yes um just of the group it just dawned on me um in the travels around, I've always been mar marveling about how tech companies collaborate. So question I'm going to get in the, in the community, I know we all are, if we were to move forward tonight, what's in it for you? I already know the answer, I think, but I've, why, why come forward tonight and say, like, so what's in it for each of these companies, per se? Or, or I'll mm -hmm. just leave it at that. So it was interesting when I went around and met with Tom, Kip, and Jim to get their signatures on that piece of paper. I think what I see, so when I went and found Jim, I found Jim, all of you I'm sure are familiar with the, the bike skills space that's growing outside of the Garmin building. Jim was in there by himself yesterday as, as a member of the board of, of uh, Bike Cochrane, working his backhoe. Um, he borrowed Kip's truck to bring their common backhoe in there to do that by himself. Apparently he's raising his own cred marker with his own staff at Garmin by being able to maneuver uh, heavy equipment. <laughs> um, but what I heard from him is that all, every one of those three gentlemen, Tom included, is vested in the community. And by, in fact, they invite other tech players to come and join the community. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, salons that, that operate opposite each other or, or restaurants. There, there's a, there's a, an exponential factor of, of benefit that you get. For me personally, in my comments that I made, for me to actually be able to find a professional job in my community, we love Cochrane, we are never leaving this place. Um, and uh, for me, it's quality of life, frankly. So the answer, if I can just paraphrase Absolutely. that. Absolutely, summarize please, Mayor Gunnar. Nothing, other than yep. intrinsic value of personal, personal building satisfaction community. Personal satisfaction of Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. No financial gain from mm -hmm. each Awesome. What I think it really shows is, you know, like uh, Smart Cities sort of started this this whole thing. We, uh, I've never seen where we have, you know, presidents and CEOs of companies volunteer their time in the interest of the community as a whole. There was no gain for them in in the Smart City. Now we've we've taken this big step where we may do an innovation center. We want to build a tech sector uh, in in Cochrane. It is good for everyone. Uh, it provides, you know, some, you know, you know, uh, uh, it's having all of these people with the same kind of common thinking all in one place only makes it better for the whole. And I think everybody sees that. And um, so, to me, it's a and it's a it's an opportunity for the town to proactively partner with the business sector to make something happen. And that's that's what we're trying to do. Awesome. And we have their support, which is, you know, lots of times governments try, you know, to engage the private sector, and and here is an example of it working. You know, so that's what I like about it. Good. All right. All right. So that was a big, yeah. <laughs> up to the moment. So now, what do we? It's up to you guys. We now have any it's more up questions? to us. Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation, and thank you to uh, the, the guests we've had tonight. Um, and you're right, uh, Mr. Devana, it's not always uh, that we get uh, the private sector stepping forward and wanting to be a part of a presentation from administration to uh, move forward on, a, on a, the next step. So I, I think it's, it's different and it's awesome. So thank you. Um, Councilor McFadden. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
Quite pleased and excited to be actually be able to put the motion on the floor that we direct administration to proceed with detailed design and costing on the Cochrane Innovation Center and Transit Hub and bring the findings back to Council for December 9th of 2019. Um, this has been, ever since we first started speaking in the Smart Cities context and get everybody excited and pulling some energies together, um, and we're finally at a day where, as a municipality, we can step forward and meaningfully invest in our local economy. And uh, I think Cochrane, it's been talked about, we've seen it in the papers before, how by more accident and, and great luck and local business leaders having visions that we're a bit of a, a tech hub. But by making this decision tonight, it's the first step in making Cochrane a, a tech hub by both design and desire. So I'm looking forward to, um, it, to getting more information on how we can do this. Uh, a lot of the questions that I had mapped out uh, have already been checked off. Um, and so a lot of my questions are just, I guess, in some of the details. But um, I think this is a great first step, and I'm glad to support it. So having said that, I did have a couple of questions in the details for you, okay. sir. Um, so timeline for construction and then open that was answered. Uh, the timeline for the at-grade crossing, is well, that? Well, okay, so uh, we have Emily Guthrie here today. We should ask him. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, um, and thank you for that. Um, we are meeting with the province this week, uh, later in the week. Uh, the CP crossing, we're meeting with the Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, we are seeking approval for our preferred location, the number one location in Gary's uh, presentation. Um, we also have number two, you know, as an alternative option, uh, but, you know, really we're seeking a timely approval from the province uh, this calendar year or early next calendar year for us to put the crossing in, um, in our preferred location. And then the projects would be, uh, would be done in parallel together. We, we're envisioning uh, uh, seeking a general contractor of some uh, to build the building, do all the landscaping, do the CP crossing, do the parking lot, and we also are planning uh, in the 2021, uh, 2020 budget to do some uh, stormwater improvements, um, water improvements and wastewater improvements on railway, which was part of our regular budgeting. And so we, we see consolidating all this together and all being done in 2020. Okay. And just to confirm, we do have, even though the details and the timing are still being worked out, both CP Rail and the province are in favor of the crossing to happen either A or B sites? Well, the, we haven't got approval from the province to put it where it's going to go. You know, so we, we do not have that approval yet. Um, we have an indication from the province that they preferred the option two. Uh, we want option one. Uh, we've, done, uh, we've done a detailed analysis of the provincial parking lot. Uh, we feel that we can uh, enhance the parking and the circulation in the parking lot and it's part of the $2 million project and we will do it at our cost rather than their cost, but we want our preferred location. Okay. Um, and then next in, um, so just to confirm, I mean the Green Trip funding is going to, can be allocated and that fits within the Green Trip grant process for half of this building to be paid for through that. Uh, the remaining, uh, the municipality will borrow. find a mechanism to borrow for. Um, so this is fitting a little bit outside of our budget process. Um, how are we going to be able to uh, look at this and taking into context the impact of this against the 10-year capital plan? We're doing it this year during the 2020-22 budget. So when you, bu when you approve a budget in December of this year, you're either going to approve a transit hub, one story building at this location with all the very, you know, still have the crossing, uh, you're still going to need parking, you're going to need all these things, or you're going to approve a 45, you know, three story building that has an incubator and innovation space. Um, and uh, the 4.4 would be rolled into our debt ceiling because we're borrowing the money. Um, but we're nowhere near our limits for borrowing, and this particular borrowing will not be funded by taxpayers, be funded by 
lease revenue. You know, so it's from a debt servicing point of view, it's not hurting us at all. It's not gonna, it's not gonna affect any other project that we were planning to borrow on because it's not property tax supported borrowing. Excellent. All right, well, thank you very much. Councillor Reed. You know, I'm excited to support this motion as well. Um, having been a part of the, the original delegation that went to Waterloo, um, I can see the, the benefits of it. A couple of comments I wanted to make. One was that, uh, to emphasize that the commercial tenant that would come into the third floor would also be responsible for being supportive to the incubator. I don't know that that was captured or not. I think the main thing to really emphasize, re-emphasize, and um, Councilor McFadden was kind of focusing in on that, is that even without any government support or government grants, um, this facility is commercially viable and uh, we'll have no burden on the taxpayers of, of Cochrane. Um, the borrowing rates are great in, at this particular time. You've amortized it over 30 years. I think you've done a great job in terms of getting us where we go. I mean, for me, the, the project, the incubator hub, um, the kind of social and economic, not just, not, not just economic, but the social shadow that this will cast in our community is incredible. I mean, literally, it's an opportunity that, um, that is just ripe for the picking. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to be a part of a council that uh, would be, look forward enough to be able to see this go. Thank you. Councilor Padeco. I just have a couple comments and one question. Um, first of all, Mr. Mr. Devano, thank you for all the information. I think you've really broken it down well. You've helped us understand kind of the cost behind it and made me feel a lot more comfortable knowing that so obviously this doesn't come back on the backs of taxpayers, which I'm thankful for. Um, Mr. Klassen, in your, in your letter and presentation, I think you nailed on a couple of things that really stood out for me and that was um, that there are many businesses here in town that start up and I think that they have great ideas. But we do know, uh, as a person being out in the community a lot, that it's very difficult a lot of times for startup businesses um, to be able to ever make their business viable because we know that lease space is high. Um, they, they have no money to kind of get started. And uh, so I appreciate some of those comments that you made. And I do know that uh, the corner co-working is a happening place to be these days and uh, there's not a whole lot of space there. So we obviously see that this is something that's up and coming and that people are looking for. And I also think that, um, you know, we constantly hear from residents that, you know, we want to see growth here in Cochrane. They don't want to see residential growth. They want to see business growth. And so I guess, you know, from that side point, um, obviously, uh, how could we not stand behind a project like this? My one question, because I know it's going to be asked, is that if this costs more than $9 million is what's projected, um, how is that going to be played out? Are we coming back and we're going to make... Uh, the community pay for this or what's the next step because okay. you know that's going to come out in a So um, what's being asked tonight is that we will do a detailed costing of the project and design so we have a fully designed building uh, come December um, if it's 9.5 million or 10.5 million then to me I'm going to be presenting you with the actual cost which will be you know at the 90 percent detailed design so we're going to be confident about the number now we're using you know guesstimate I guess um, I will then present you you know with a recommendation either yes you can move ahead or no you can't move ahead if you do move ahead let's say it's 10.5 here is the financial plan moving forward you will make the final decision to, to construct this building in December with a full set of information if you approve this motion tonight. Perfect, thank you. I think uh, the, residents, uh, the residents will probably want to know that, so thank you for that information. Councillor Nagel. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Devan, I think you've done an exceptional job on the whole plan and everything. Um, I'm 100% supportive of what's proposed here this evening. I think it's super important that we are supporting uh, economic diversification, particularly within the tech industry. We've already got a bit of a advantage over other communities our size. It's kind of crazy that we have these major employers here who are doing major tech business when other communities of our size really could not uh, attract that sort of talent. And I think leaning into that current success is gonna create even more success here in Cochrane. And I think an uh, incubator like this, even if one in 10 companies came out as successful employers that turned into large companies, I think it'd be well worth our time. 
but we've heard from other communities that we it's somewhere like 60% of the companies uh, regularly succeed. Uh, so very, very supportive of it. And my only question is, um, in the building here, is, is it going to be possible to expand in the future in the design that we're thinking of? Or is this something that once it's built, it's going to be pretty much stuck at that size uh, well yeah. into the future? So um, it, there is a, a possibility you could make for a bigger building, but you have to spend more money on the um, foundation. I got Gary here. He could explain it probably better than I could. But our, our thinking was is that we're trying to um, to create this incubator sector and then the idea is that people will move through the incubator out of the incubator and into private space not into min more municipal space because we're not trying to compete with the private sector all i'm trying to do is make sure we have a viable project to move forward with which i require some revenue to come in and that's why we've created a third floor with the 15,000. There is some thought in a tri-site project that we could also move across the street and build a larger structure that could accommodate maybe some of our new incubators. But my personal preference would be that those incubators move into the Griffin Ranch area, go into the Greystone area, and that we're not seen to be competing directly. And so I'm, I feel we should only build a three-story building, but if you want to talk more about the details, Gary could probably talk about what we have to do to make it so you could go higher. But you know, we're only allowed to, in town to go five now, right? I don't even know if we have a five-story building in town yet. Um, maybe up in Fireside, I think that one, maybe. So I don't know if you're satisfied with the answer, but... I'm satisfied. Okay, perfect. Councillor Flowers. Thank you. I would echo what everyone has said so far, just a couple of different things. Um, I love the idea of young people being able to stay in our community. It's always been an issue that there was a piece missing for them and they would leave for quite a few years before they came back. So it's exciting to think about keeping them here. Um, this deviates a little bit from what the tri-site people had talked about, but I can see why you want to switch it to the other side. There's lots of good reasons for doing that. It makes sense. Uh, the parking, could you just discuss um, what will happen with the parking when the new library starts? Okay, so our thought is, is to create the parking lot, up 75 plus parking stalls on the other side. Um, when we're in a position to construct um, the Arts and Culture Center, the uh, l new library, any additional office space, um, that parking would then be eliminated and we would build underground parking in that location that would accommodate the art center, the, the uh, transit hub, the incubator space. And so the investment, the 500,000 investment, you know, will be lost at that point because we're gonna go underground with our parking. We also have an opportunity uh, to put, uh, to build a parkade in town um, in this area in the uh, area and so there there's three million dollars set aside for park shared what they call shared parking where i'm recommending you use 500 of that to create these spots uh, but there is an opportunity not to go underground but maybe build a parkade somewhere in the quarry um, area uh, but we thought it was more important uh, to create a community-based space on the transit hub space than to create a parking lot on that space. And therefore, it's going to be a community gathering spot because there's going to be a building, a plaza, and grass, and trees, and ponds. And, and that's why we didn't put any parking on that site and use the other site. Excellent. Um, the tenant space, well, did you consider the um, tenant improvements in the budget when you were putting it in or do they will that be over and above um, so we are incorporating certain tenant improvements in the budget so bathrooms um, rough in kitchen stuff like that uh, but until we have the detailed costing done and the functional I, call, I think you call it functional plan for the building yeah okay functional plan for the building we won't know exactly what we're building there is going to be 
we will, within the nine million, we have to get the first floor, our floor really, you know, reception area, offices, all that stuff's gotta be covered. When you move into the top floor, we're, we're talking with the potential tenants that they have some leasehold improvements that they would do. And then on the incubator floor, it's primarily an open space, but there will be some um, offices and we'll be working with the cost consultant to incorporate those costs into that space because there's no paying tenant there. So the answer is yes. And the one thing that I worry about the most is the executive director not starting for a year. I would love at budget time to look at whether we could take some money from reserves or somewhere from a grant or something to try to get them in place sooner because I think it's pivotal to the success of the building to get the partnerships in place and um, get things going quicker. Yeah. So the thinking has been, um, you yeah, know, the incubator space, they don't pay any rent, right? So it's, it's like zero. So um, our thinking is, is that the space doesn't lose money, it's not making money, you know, either. And so the thinking was until we have revenue coming in, it, it's not a big loss if the incubator doesn't start till July 2021. You know, I don't really necessarily see why it's really important to start the incubator on January 1. If you want to start it on January 1, then you'll have to provide some funding, some seed funding in 2020. Um, so that'll be up to council to debate in December. Partnerships with institutions take a long time to get in place and have to go through a lot of levels of um, bureaucracy. So it would be nice to start sooner. Yeah. Um, I think that was it. You. you know, the, 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 you know, this is the thing too about the whole project, right? Like it's, it's going to evolve. You know, it's going to start small, and then it's going to build. You know, you get the the partnerships, the, you know, the philanthropists, you know, all these people that want to get maybe get attached to this. It'll start small, and then it'll grow, and it'll grow, and it'll grow, and hopefully, it's like the Velocity Garage in in, in Waterloo at, or Kitchener at some point and it's wildly successful and we've got lots of Tom Grolins coming out of there, you know, but it's not gonna be, day one, it's not gonna be successful like that. So it just, to me, it's, a, it's gonna take time. We have enough money to build a building. That's, we, that's the starting point to me. But don't expect like one year in, it's just like buzzing. I think that would be a mistake to have that assumption. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. I uh, wanted to thank the members in the gallery from 4i, Garmin, MC, and things for being here. Really, it means a lot and it, to support this project and that we see that community support. Um, Mr. Devana for um, turning this into something more and, ha and having the vision to see that this can be more than just a transit hub and to um, use our green trip dollars towards this. It all makes sense to me. I, I have two devil's advocate kind of questions as I often do. Um, if this isn't the success we think it's going to be, if we uh, secure an anchor tenant and they drop out, if everything goes wrong, uh, I was just hoping we could, we could paint a picture of what would happen, what uh, amounts of money would we be on the hook for and what would we use the building for if this didn't go anywhere near as according to plan. Okay, so we're looking for a minimum commitment on the lease commercial space. So we're not, it's not a month to month lease or anything like that. So we will be expecting at a minimum a five year commitment to the building for the commercial space. So that assuming that happens, you know, and we have uh, lease agreements in place, the building will break even. Even if the incubator is a complete failure, then there will be 15,000 square feet of space that will be available for two pur purposes. One purpose will be to accommodate the town's growth moving forward, which we know is going to happen eventually. The second uh, purpose, we could lease it out for commercial purpose and we will make money. You know, we will we'll be in a $300,000 surplus. Um, we also know that the tech sector um, is actively looking for more space. 
And so the 15,000 square feet that we're putting on the top floor could easily grow to 30,000 square feet. And then we're in the commercial leasing business. Um, but that's a worst case scenario where we actually um, are not successful. But I, I, I feel strongly that we will have commercial tenants in place by December with long-term leases and the risk is low. Thank you for that. I thought a question worth asking, even though I have the same uh, feelings you do, that this is a, going to be an excellent success. Uh, also, you talked about borrowing limits, how it's not property tax supported borrowing. So then I expect that this would not have an effect on upcoming borrowing that we may have planned or have any delays for planned capital projects, including important center ave expansion or intersection upgrades upcoming. Yeah, it will not yeah. affect those projects. Excellent. Okay. Um, look forward to it all. I'm a big proponent. Do we have a motion on the floor? Or? I think it was way back over was there. Way, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, go at length. I think I've spoken uh, at length previously about my support for this project and uh, obviously the two tours of Waterloo and Kitchener and Toronto and uh, those have been uh, highlighted tonight. But uh, I'm excited to see the uh, support from Council to move this forward to the next level and it is just the next level as Mr. Devan has pointed out we have the stop gap in December to uh, check before we leap again into the uh, into the exciting 2020 project a um, few things I just wanted to highlight and Councillor Flowers you talked about this the deviation from the tri-site plan uh, this by no means uh, by moving this building to the east is uh, taking away what was concept planned for that yeah. site so we still uh, to me it's made it's just flipping it yeah um, we still have a site for the rail um, on the railway track instead of being on the east side it's now on the west side in the west triangle um, and there's still space for the uh, maker space um, it, yeah. on the uh, fronting onto um, yeah, you know, like maybe an L-shaped building fronting onto railway and backing onto the side of the bowling alley or what's you know yeah. it's there. So there, the tri site to me it is being respected. Um, we're just saying that from a, uh, if you're going to build your first building and based on where the pedestrian crossing is and that the best place to put it is on the is on the on the east side. That's Understood. It. So the. I'm excited that we have our MLA in, in the house tonight to uh, hear the importance of the uh, meeting we have with the Minister of Infrastructure to get uh, site one for our pedestrian crossing. So I'm quite confident. It's not the first time it's heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, moving on. Parking lot. Um, I've heard from many in the community, especially in the business sector, in the quarry section, as of you. Um, are we creating a sterilized parking lot of people park and riding to use our transit system across the street and filling our parking lot? What measures are we going to take no, we, to? Yeah, there has to be, it's not going to be a park and ride. There has to be, you know, there's going to be, you know, for commercial tenants, you're going to have to have some kind of reserve parking, some kind of arrangement, you know, so that they have their parking. Uh, you also have to have some parking for the transit um, but we will have to have a set of policies around that parking lot, you know, and who can use that parking lot. What's the purpose of the parking lot It is definitely not for park and ride, you know, so there may be need, you know, the public parking spaces may need to have like two hours maximum or one hour maximum. You're going to need some policy framework. Can't be like the rest of town or people will drive their cars down there, get on the regional bus and and, yeah. and park there for eight hours. That's not the intention. It can be the intention for the commercial tenant, for sure, uh, some of the incubator space. Um, but we're also encouraging people to take transit. Right. We're going to have bike facilities there to encourage people to drive their bike um, into this area. You know, so we're going to build a, you know, my hope is, you know, a, a signature building, uh, most modern, from a technology point of view, as far as heating, lighting, transportation, alternative modes, all that stuff. It's an innovation building. It has Can't to be innovative. Be innovative, yeah, agreed. Uh, I do think that that's an important message that we have to get out 
to the public uh, if we were to build this building is that this is not a park and ride. This is not an LRT station from the city where you create eight acres of sterilized parked cars for the day. Uh, yeah. um, and then long-term plan is to actually expand the library as per the um, tri-site plan and that parking will then go underground. Yeah, or go into a parkade. Right, okay. Um, so I do think, uh, again, I'm speaking to our MLA here tonight, that we really are a poster child for our, uh, the province in the uh, type of community that can take a provincial fund and leverage that fund into something uh, long-term uh, revenue generating. Uh, you talked about um, the, you know, diversifying our economy ourselves and, you know, really leveraging that fund into something much, much grander. So I'm excited about that. Um, the, uh, the other note that I would like to make is that this is not, um, and you, you talked about this, Mr. Devan, about that we're not competing with the private sector. Uh, this, in fact, um, and Councillor Reed talked about this, that the tenant must have some form of uh, incubation in there, you know, we're hoping that, right? And that uh, this, in fact, actually feeds the private sector. And the other uh, real aha moment I had in uh, Waterloo was, uh, this last trip, was that um, this is not just about the tech industry. This may be a tech incubator. It might be tech focused on everything we've been talking about, innovation, but this actually feeds our community. Uh, it brings people to the community who are going to shop. It brings uh, jobs, as you've talked about, Councillor Flowers. It uh, also is bringing jobs and more income and revenue opportunities for uh, realtors, um, people that are leasing space, because we're going to be feeding them with our uh, successful tech businesses. Um, it, uh, the lawyers, the accountants, uh, it's, it's a really a ripple effect going out into the entire community of Cochrane. So I was struggling to find, you know, I get questions about well, why are you guys so focused on tech? It's exciting and people are talking about it, but this really has the ability to uh, change Cochrane and allow us to be self-sufficient for years into the future. So I'm super excited about this uh, opportunity. Um, and the last one, and I, this is where uh, Councillor Fredeco was going, was the long-term viability. And I just wanted to ask again, uh, if we had zero incubator uh, tenants, I'm just calling them, or uh, startups coming in, um, what would our budget look like? The same. Exactly the same as it looks right now. So this is the one time ever we look at a business plan that the worst case is actually what's being given to us. So I, I like that I, opportunity. Um, so I'm not going to talk much more at length, but I do hope, and I'm, I'm hopeful and encouraged by what I've heard so far and with the uh, uh, architect in the room that we build something special. Um, we don't, as a community, have very op many opportunities to build buildings. Uh, we've built a pool. It's awesome. We heard from our uh, rec society today. Uh, the last one, I don't recall. Um, there, there's been additions. There's been remodels but there's not been a standalone building. We have an opportunity to build something that's gonna be uh, long-term, 50 plus years into the community. We've talked about the benefits of it, but I'm hopeful that the look of this building is something that everyone, whether you walk in or not, is proud of. And I, I think the, the way it's situated, the pathway and the open space outside is really shaping up to be something super cool. So I uh, look forward to the next steps. So uh, that was my short version of promoting the building tonight. So, yeah. <laughs> Those are easy questions. <laughs> All right. So motion on the floor is not to approve uh, building the building tomorrow, but it's actually to the next step of uh, design and budgeting. Everybody's clear? Uh, no more questions? All those in favor of moving forward. It's carried. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yep.
Do we want to do a five minute break? Yeah, okay. All right, let's get back to work. Finance. Welcome. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Tanya Galan. I believe this would be the first time I'm presenting as your newest finance manager. Um, I'm here today to bring forward three items for your consideration from the finance realm. Um, the first of which I'm going to speak to is the Eco Center expansion. Um, we're coming to you tonight to ask for an additional $300,000 to be funded from reserves to expand the Eco Center. Um, it was budgeted as part of the 2019 capital budget, uh, $340,000. However, upon initial design and consultation, it was noted that, let me refer to my notes here, um, that there were some issues as uh, we dug in. Uh, it was determined that we would need to um, not to use the facility initially considered and consider another office space, a new um, office space that's almost four times the size. Um, a decision was made to uh, explore the plans that would allow for this new building to displace the existing office. Um, and it would allow for the footprint to, my apologies, I'm making us jump around, um, for a footprint to better accommodate the desired uh, training room size to build out operator space to increase uh, teams' ability to monitor the yard in their office space, ability to maximize the space uh, available for admin and management, and the ability to fit an entire team under one roof. Um, so with this request for uh, the additional funding, uh, we'd be able to um, complete this project as proposed um, with the budget, complete budget of the additional funding of 300,000 for 640. The second item I wanted to bring forward for your consideration was an additional $900,000 of funding. Um, and this funding would be going towards the Cochrane Detachment Project. Um, currently, we have purchased uh, two acres of land, however, have come to the conclusion that that parcel of land isn't going to be big enough for this design. Uh, we would like to ask for more funding to um, purchase a larger parcel of land making the total 4.66 acres of land. Um, if I could just jump in quickly, um, I just want to clarify the additional acre, the full site is 4.66, we have already purchased that. The additional funding is to get us to complete detailed design and costing of the facility, which will now be located on the 4.66 acres. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's good. That was <laughs> having that same question go through my mind. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. So um, with that, um, we're asking for an additional $900,000, um, bringing the total cost of the project up to $4.7 million. Mr. DeVanna? Oh. Oh. oh, you're not quite done? Okay, I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the third item I'm bringing forward is the second quarter reports for 2019, covering the period from January 1st to June 30th. Um, they were both attached in the package for your review. Um, for the operating report, uh, it presents a picture of our financial status uh, for the first six months. It um, should... Um, if revenue and expenditures, of course, had been uh, happened evenly throughout the year, we, of course, would expect the results to be at 50%. However, in many cases, such as fundings and grants, are not um, received evenly throughout the year. So in some instances, um, we are either under or over that 50% mark. It is anticipated that by year end, these accounting adjustments, grants, and extra funds and or spending will have happened that we will be on target. Uh, we'll be coming back with the third quarter results um, later on this fall, um, which will include the projections 
and give us a better idea where we're at, where we're looking to be at the end of 2019. The second report I included was for capital. Um, it was um, for many, many projects that we have underway. We're a very busy municipality. All the technology and equipment projects were still in progress as of June 2019. We had nine new fleet capital projects underway in 2019. The brush attachment was completed. All other seven fleet projects were in pro progress as of June 2019. And the bush buggy fleet item capital project uh, was on hold but is expected to get underway this fall. The green ship funding of $1.6 million was received and is included in the results. This funding will be used to purchase eight buses for the on-demand transit system. The total budget for this was $2 million. There is a total of 17 ongoing and three completed facility projects underway in 2019. Um, I've spoken to, we also have this facilities eco center project underway to which we're asking for more funding, as well as the Cochrane RCMP and municipal enforcement detachment, to which again, we're asking for another $900,000. There were 37 infrastructure projects undergo, underway in 2019, which continue to be ongoing as of June. Um, the implications for this is um, that the recycling facility reserve would be reduced, uh, leaving an approximate current balance of $6,000 if we were to fund the additional $300,000 from reserves. Facility growth reserve would be reduced um, if we were to fund the RCMP depot detachment, leaving an approximate current balance of $500,000. The options I bring forward are for your approval for the extra funding for $300,000 for the Eco Center, the additional $900,000 for the Municipal Enforcement Detachment, and that you receive the second quarter 2019 results for information. Option two is that these are not approved as laid out. Okay. That's all the information I have to bring forward. Your first presentation to council is over. Now you can take a breath. In a record? Was <laughs> no. it the fastest? No. <laughs> Mr. Devanna, did you want to add something um, to the... I saw your light come on once. Um, item number two, the council approved the additional funding for the facility growth for the 900000 This is an absolutely uh, must-have. We, we have to do the detailed design and costing for that building. And so I feel like definitely we don't have any more detail to provide you to, until you uh, approve this money for this building so I, I, I feel you should support that and I feel you should support number three I do have a bit of you know on reflection a little concern that we've not provided you enough detail to approve number one you know why do we need to go from 300,000 to 600,000 you know what how has the footprint changed from what we approved before to what we're approving now. Um, so I feel like, you know, unless we're able to provide that additional detail now, um, I feel like you should defer until you get more information, item number one. Um, I think Rick has some additional information or Mr. Deans to provide, but I just, I'm not comfortable approving it with the amount of information we've given you. Okay, thank you for that, it's helpful. Councilor Reed, uh, I wasn't going to make a motion, but I wanted some <coughs> clarity. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear all of your presentation, and it's just because I'm going deaf. And <laughs> <coughs> um, so I'm trying to understand then the <coughs> the so is it that we had approved and budgeted for the uh, eco center expansion and the RCMP building, and now we're coming back and saying we were we were short in that estimate. And therefore, we're coming back to council to approve additional funds. Is that is that what this is all about? I I guess mm -hmm. I'm directing my question to you. No. No. Okay. So good. I think Mr. Devana can answer that best. I guess my feeling for number one, we had to three hundred thousand for the expansion. That was supposed to be covering the entire cost. Now we need to pay only six. Of the eco, we're talking about for the, the eco, eco center, center yeah. only. Um, and so that's a you know it's a doubling of the request for funding and I, I just feel like the information is not sufficient 
that should justify you just giving it to us um, as an additional amount. The second one is a little bit different to me. So we've done, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Lowe has done a lot of work on, uh, on advancing the RCMP building project. And now we're in a position to ask you for money to do the detailed design and costing. Oh, okay. And so to advance that project, we need this additional funding approved. But that's not really a change in you know, scope. You know, the first one is definitely a change in scope of the project because it's doubled in cost. You know, and I, that's correct. So, um, Similar to what we just did with the yeah. Innovation Center, it's to the next level of costing and design. So it's just okay. that, you know, sure, we finally got to the point of the RCMP okay. where we're able to advance this project. The only way to advance is to do the detailed design and costing. And do you want to do it now or do you want to wait till December? That would be your choice. We would recommend you do it now. You know, Get it going. It is a priority project. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. And it's coming out of reserve, which the money is there. Okay. Councillor Fadigal. I have one question, and, and it's by no shape or any way to say that the RCP station is not needed because anybody who's been in the attachment knows that it's obviously very needed. Um, but where did that project, you know, go back even, you know, before this council was ever sitting here, where did that project start at? Like, what was the cost estimate long ago um, versus what we're sitting at now? Uh, to answer the question through the chair, uh, the, the project's had multiple different variations of what a project budget might look like, always just a target to get it to the design, detailed design stage. Um, when it was originally advanced, um, there was the Protective Services Advisory Committee which chose the location. Unfortunately, at the time, they chose a two-acre site which is not um, suitable for the size of the detachment that's required nor the parking requirements that were identified once um, myself and Mr. Barcy took the project over and started to look into more detail what the space requirements were going to be both inside and outside. Um, that was when we transitioned to the 4.66 acre site. Um, unfortunately, that results in more geotechnical and more in-depth detailed design and that's where the original budget of 3.8 which was the last amount which was set for the two acre site to get us through to this point changed because we moved to the larger site and now we're at that point of detailed design. Perfect thank you I just I just think it's it's a valuable comment that's going to come from the community from people that remember long ago they're going to say well like this project started at XYZ and now it's growing to balloon and, and in their minds they might not understand all the steps that um, needed to come out of that. So thank you for explaining that so that Absolutely. we can explain it better out to the community. And that was exactly going to be my point. That is our job to help get that message out of why things have changed and what and how, right? So good, good question. Uh, does anyone want to make a motion? Or have a question, another question? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor, who's blinking? Reed. <laughs> I'll make the motion. Uh, so, the first one, just to be clear, yeah. that, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to just say uh, the recommendation would be uh, a modified option one, which be that that would be the council to approve the additional funding for the facility growth from the facility growth reserve of nine hundred thousand for the RCMP ah. municipal services detachment, and that council receive the uh, second quarter financial statements from the town. That would be the motion. Okay, we need three motions. Separate. So the first one is the council approved the additional funding for the 900 for the RCMP. Okay, I'll okay. move that. Okay. Any questions or concerns about that particular motion? Councillor Wilson? I was hoping to, um, I heard Mr. Deans had some extra information for us on option or point number one, so I was hoping I could hear that before we. I asked well, we're just doing number two. Where we're first. Gonna, gotcha. So we get, if we approve or not of that uh, if there's any questions about the RCMP okay I've got one for that then. okay okay I was ho hoping Miss Lowe maybe you could uh, fill me in just a little bit more about I, I'm, I'm never sure when we're talking about the, R the RCMP detachment exactly what funding is the town portion and what is the federal portion or if there is any federal portion it's the one service in town where I I don't completely understand our funding model so maybe in a I, I'm only bringing it up now because when we're talking about this part of the project, I just like to understand. I, I know we're putting our, our uh, municipal enforcement there with the RCMP and then how, how that breaks down to help me decide on this matter. 
Through the chair, I'm currently the um, detachment houses both provincial and municipal resources as well as some specialized teams. Um, it is the municipality's responsibility through the municipal policing agreement to pay for 90% of our members as well as to provide accommodation. So the requirement for the accommodation has been something that has been on um, the radar for a while. Um, the detachment itself is roughly, we're looking at probably around the 30,000, 30, between 30,000 and 40,000 square feet of that BRCMP will probably house, I don't want to throw numbers out there, but um, it's a good at least 70% of it with the inclusion of opportunity for future growth. So while we have five-year staffing projections for the RCMP, the intent is not to move in and immediately be outgrown out of the facility. It's to ensure that um, we have space for growth within. Then we also, the reason that this project is going to go through borrowing is because we will then charge back um, the cost of borrowing to the RCMP for their portions that they have to lease from us. Um, and that would be the provincial side of the house. So the federal portion is their lease payment? Correct. For that is correct. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm hopefully, hopefully, when it comes to this year's budget, I'll understand a little bit better. Maybe, maybe I've, I, I, I combed through the document in previous years, and I, I didn't see that um, listed. So, uh, hope, hopefully, we can uh, talk a little bit more about that budget time. But I appreciate that. That's my only question on this one. I have okay. a question on the first one. Councilor McFadden on the RCMP. Yeah, sorry, one question on there, and you did allu allude to it, but how many staff total, so RCMP, st town staff, ballparking, are going to be in that building? Through the chair, we currently fund 23 municipal RCMP members as well as seven um, support staff. Right, and then there'll be, uh, the sheriffs will be in there? Correct. For an additional whatever. That's correct. It's, I think they are currently housing about 54 members um, and then additional support staff. So 54 and 7 and then victim services will also have space? That is correct. In there? And the municipal enforcement team. And which is, I don't remember how many? Uh, eight. 100 people roughly. 70 or 80 people in there? That is correct. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. All those in favor of the additional funding for the finance facility growth reserve of 900,000 for the RCMP detachment. Carried, thank you. Um, did you want to go back and ask your question to Mr. Deans now of the eco growth, or the, sorry, the eco center? Yeah. Please, I'd love to hear some more information about the eco center. Okay, through the chair, um, some of the information that's been provided to me on the, some of the proponents on this project. So when it was originally approved in 2019 for 300,000, we had a site selected that was adjacent to the front part of the existing eco center. Um, upon further investigation of that site, it became apparent that we would be displacing a significant amount of landscaping and we would be um, below our minimum required landscaping for our, to maintain accordance with the land use bylaw. Uh, that would also involve some uh, movement of some existing uh, Fortis power poles, which uh, came with an associated cost. There was definitely some concerns regarding overland drainage in that site. And by joining onto the existing building, uh, further details um, suggested that we would need to look at some of the insulating factors and um, of the existing site and there would have to be further upgrades on both the new and the existing by tagging a new building onto the existing building. Um, also there was a gas line relocate and expansion to the sanitary sewer line from the building. So they looked at what some of the potential mitigation strategies could be and that would be based on the, the site layout itself and the footprint of the existing building it was best determined to relocate the entire new expansion to a different part of the eco center and with that in mind we could create some uh, better traffic flow through we could have better monitoring of the of the facility while the public is in the or while the staff is in the office to ensure that they have a full visual of the facility we'd also end up with a a more um, 
larger footprint that could certainly take the eco center well into the future as far as having a uh, excellent area for training. Uh, we do a lot of um, educational um, presentations to various schools and we talk about waste sorting and things like that. So to have a larger facility to do that type of training would be, would be welcome to that, uh, that operation. So it was mostly relocating the existing expansion to a new part of the eco center and constructing a new building. Okay, thank you. And I was hoping you could also possibly remind me if there's a portion of the ongoing operational cost is covered by Rocky View County, is that correct? Or is that all town funded? Yes, that's correct. There is a contribution, an annual contribution from Rocky View County and based on the percentage of use of the facility. Right. Approximate percentage of use. Right. And I expect Rocky View County would not be helping with this, the additional funds needed for what we're talking about right now? Well, at the end of the day, the, the money that's contributed from Rocky View County does go into the operation of that facility. And at the end of the year, if there's any surpluses realized from the operation of that facility, they go into the facility reserve. So it's, uh, it's difficult to say yes or no to answer that question, but. Right, okay. And uh, final question, um, tax implications. There's, if I'm reading this correctly, we have the 300,000 reserves right now, there wouldn't be tax implications from the additional 300? That's correct. All of the, the funding for the eco center does go through the utility bill, through the eco center fees. So there's nothing from the tax rate for right. this project. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councillor Padeco. On top of Councillor Wilson's, uh, if uh, obviously if we take a delay and we wait for maybe some further uh, some further details or um, in timeline, what does that kind of delay the project at? Or are we looking at does it delay it by you know a short few weeks? Does it delay it by months? Does it through the chair to Councillor Fideko, if the project is delayed until say budget time where we bring this back again as a budget request, we're looking at two to three months of delay in uh, going into some detailed design on the, the new expansion. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one point I would bring up on the eco center. Um, and I think I, I mentioned this maybe a few weeks ago or maybe it was months. There seemed to be flying by pretty quickly, but I, I would, if we're going to be sending this back for a little bit more information, I would wonder if we can, and I don't want to derail the project, so if that's, if that's what this question is, then I'm willing to, to wait. But I would like to, us to look at the um, ability to receive our green bins at the eco center. And I, I got this idea from a local, I'm sure you're aware, I've talked to Mr. Barcy about it, about um, the possibility of using our green waste as uh, with a, a type of innovation and equipment that we could dump into this thing <laughs> and uh, it, it, it uh, takes out the moisture de and compresses the green you know the organics into uh, biofuel and I believe there's a, a market for that so that may potentially we could turn our green bins into revenue, but also some cost savings and trucking and et cetera. So uh, I wonder if there's a, maybe a fit and maybe it doesn't fit on that site now. I just, if you could just include that in maybe a discussion with um, Mr. Barcy, uh, you know, Fabrizio, uh, whatever, a high level only at this point, but I just, it just reminded me to bring it up. There's no question. It's just a. Could you please add that, uh, Councillor Nagel? I would uh, like to move that we delay the decision on the increased funding for the Eco Center expansion. Um, it's not very often that our CAO tells us to delay spending, <laughs> so I think we should take his advice. Well put. Okay. Any other comments on the Eco Center? No. All those in favor of delaying for more info? It's carried. Thank you. And one last motion to uh, receive the quarter to financial report. Councillor Flowers, covering January 1st to June 30th. 
All those in favor of that? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, notices of motion. Not yet. Okay. Um, mayor's report. It's in here somewhere. Uh, well, first I have, <laughs> I always forget these. I have three proclamations. We'll just get them out of the way. Um, and they're important. Uh, I'd like to proclaim uh, Culture Day, September 27th, 28th, 29th. Um, we heard a little bit about that earlier. Uh, I'd like to proclaim Orange Shirt Day for September 30th. Wow. We're going to be uh, busy September 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th now. And then proclaim Cerebral Palsy Day for October 6th, 2019. So those are out of the way. Um, Mayor's report. Um, just really, I think the only thing I really wanted to say tonight was I have really been focusing my attention for the last two weeks on increasing our provincial presence. Um, that, not, I mean, amongst the other things I've been doing, signing things and doing mayor stuff, it's uh, the, I really feel there's, a, and I've been talking about this for a while, but increasing our provincial presence, we are, um, I feel we're doing a better job as a community. Um, the mid-sized cities I talked about uh, and gave you an update on that. Um, the fact that I'd been named as a co-chair with the uh, two other mayors from Red Deer and Lethbridge. Um, we are meeting on the way to AUMA tomorrow to have our first meeting. So I'm meeting in Red Deer tomorrow morning at 9.30 um, with the two mayors to talk about a provincial, um, like a potential, sorry, funding model that we could bring back to council and uh, how we could keep the mid-sized cities afloat over the, uh, the years. So notwithstanding that, the CMRB, um, we had another meeting where the Rocky View County put the motion on the flow. Well, it was an IRF application to uh, remove the population caps on all of the hamlets in Rocky View County. Uh, that was defeated at the meeting. Uh, there was a lot of discussion. We had three uh, communities provide uh, uh, letters of, what's the word, Mr. Hyman? Challenge, thank you. Um, so uh, Calgary spoke against, um, Mr. Hyman spoke and represented our community against, and Airdrie spoke against. Um, Rockaby County was not happy, obviously, with the outcome. It was a 5-5, five, five, I believe, was the, was the vote. I mean, Calgary was against it, so it was never going to pass anyways. But it did start the conversations around uh, let's go, like, um, so, they're even to the point where some of the dysfunction, I would say, and I'm trying to be careful with my words because I believe wholeheartedly that we need a CMRB and that we're going to eventually do great things, but it's going to take some time to get there. Um, to the point where the very next, or one of the next things on the agenda was the work plan that the CMRB staff had created about Here's our marching orders. Do you agree with these, uh, this set of uh, plans to work through till 2021? It was defeated. So out of, I, I don't understand the, the thinking there behind that, but uh, we essentially have not given our staff anything to do. They're going to continue to work obviously, but not with a approved business plan from the board. So it's, really up in the air right now but uh, so on that same page uh, yesterday I believe it was it was a busy weekend I was at the McDougal Stoney Mission Society Treaty 7 event where I sat beside uh, the Minister of Culture I'd write this down culture multiculturalism and status of women uh, the Honorable Leela uh, here I believe is yeah I can't read my own writing <laughs> uh, Lovely person, uh, very well-spoken was there. Uh, she was telling me a uh, little bit about what she had heard from the, how, what CMRV had done to Rocky View. And so I was telling her what Cochrane's um, reasoning was and she was very interested in 
in hearing our side, she was only hearing, uh, she represents Chestermere and Strathmore as an MLA. So we have our work cut out for us, I believe, to continue to put the message forward that we want to work together as a region. We want to get better and we're going to. We just need to get through some trust issues, I believe. And, um, but it's, it's a bigger battle than what I think anybody anticipated. And it's really hard to sit through at times. So um, AUMA is next. Um, just want to highlight, everybody got a package today. It's in front of them. I am super proud of the work that's gone into this. Um, we have upped our game uh, immensely from years gone by. I mean, I don't, wasn't on council three years ago. I don't know what, exactly what was happening at AUMA, but this is what I'm, I'm happy to be going and representing our community with. Yeah, it's a blue binder. It looks like not much from out there, but um, there's a lot of work that went into this. To the fact that we're meeting with six ministers in the next week, we have a huge week ahead of us. And um, I'm proud of the, the fact that we're going there. And we talked about the Minister of Infrastructure earlier, Minister of Transportation, obviously. Everybody's still talking about the, the, the intersection. <laughs> uh, Minister of Indigenous Relations, uh, Minister of Seniors and Housing. I had dinner at the uh, Big Hill Lodge fundraiser on the weekend and sat with the CAO, Carol Brush. Bro, Bro, Borshen, Borshnik, um, sorry Carol, um, the CAO of the Rocky View Foundation. Uh, she will be joining us in that meeting. I'm happy that we're, we're having these meaningful engagements with the ministers. Uh, the MLA Guthrie was at the meeting as well, so had an opportunity to, or the dinner, uh, to talk about um, his role in all of this in the next week, Minister of Environment and Parks super excited about uh, talking about water with the Minister of Environment and Minister of Economic Development and Trade and Tourism about our Innovation Centre. So happy that we move forward tonight on the next stage of that. So um, kudos to uh, our team, like Rebecca and Kristen. I mean, giving us profiles of each minister, what they look like, what they represent, um, little things that go a long way to making us look a lot better and for us to do a, a good job. So uh, again, no pressure gang, but this is a big uh, week for us to move some things forward. So again, uh, Mr. Devana, if you would please pass that on to everyone that had a hand in doing this. Um, that's excellent work. Uh, I think I covered everything. So no more proclamations? No? That is my report. I look forward to AUMA this week. Anyone else have a report? Crickets? <laughs> All right. Okay. So that I guess that's the meeting then. The meeting is, uh, as Chris Sheard would say, terminated. <laughs>